Hi, welcome back guys. This is your friend, the D and What If, with another fanfiction. This is the movie of What If Deku was an angel. All credits for this video go to their respective authors. So please support the real author. Check out the link in the description for more details. Please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel if you want more videos like this. Now let's get into the fanfic. Summary. There is a realm beyond mortal sight. One home to the most ethereal of beings. It is this land, this sacred haven. That mortals on that accursed earth refer to as heaven. It is a realm untouched by the hands of sin, its holy light shining in even the darkest of corners. Yet for centuries, there have been many fearful whispers to echo throughout the gleaming corridors, voices carrying the relics of a prophecy thought to be long forgotten. Rumors of the enigma, the Deku, as the others call him. From his curly black hair to his dull, vanta black eyes with their swirling specks of gold, he was an abomination in every sense of the word. He was ungodly in a realm ruled by God himself. That was why on this day, the day everyone had been hailing as the day of sanctification, that vile Deku was to be cast from heaven in front of everyone, much to the relief of the vengeful angels who were to watch the display. Izuku doesn't care what anyone says. God is a complete fucking dick. Chapter 1 Exile Notes I originally wrote this as a Teen Wolf fic, but I've gotten super obsessed with BNHA again, so here I am rewriting it in this fandom. Noted, I previously only wrote one chapter. The concept is basically the same. But I've also changed a lot and added some new ideas. I may do art for this, but I'm not too sure as of right now. If so, the art will be coming as soon as tomorrow. But again, I don't know yet. Also, I'm looking for a beta for this work and possible future works. If you're interested, you don't have to do more than one, so don't feel like there will be a bunch of work. If you're interested, shoot me an email at spiderxlilis6thixgarden at gmail.com or message me on fanfiction.net or wattpad.com under the work with the same name. That is all. Enjoy, my gremlins lesser than three. Edit, I've updated the chapter, as I was pretty sleep-deprived when I originally wrote it. It should be a bit cleaner now. Chapter Text There is a realm beyond mortal sight. One home to the most ethereal of beings. It is this land, this sacred haven. That mortals on that accursed earth refer to as heaven. It is a realm untouched by the hands of sin, its holy light shining in even the darkest of corners. Yet for centuries... There have been many fearful whispers to echo throughout the gleaming corridors, voices carrying the relics of a prophecy thought to be long forgotten. Rumors of the enigma, the Deku, as the others call him, circulate with infamy. Angels selling the poor boy's name without so much as a second thought. He may be an angel, but he was created from something unnatural, something vile and unholy. From his curly black hair to his dull, vanta black eyes with their swirling specks of gold, he was an abomination in every sense of the word. He was ungodly in a realm ruled by God himself. His mere presence in this holy land was blasphemous, a profane intrusion challenging the divine order established by God himself. His true origin was a closely guarded secret, and none of the other angels were privy to the knowledge of how he came to be. The only thing they knew for certain was that he was born of destruction and darkness, chaos and desolation. No one in the heavenly realm dared to so much as stand in the boy's presence. He is a sinner, nothing more. That was why on this day, the day everyone had been hailing as the day of sanctification, that vile Deku was to be cast from heaven in front of everyone, much to the relief of the vengeful angels watching the display before them. Praise be to our Lord, for the unsightly Deku will never see the brilliant light of heaven again. Someone in the stands shouted in triumph. Deku would never again feel God's warmth shine upon him, let alone stand in the realm ruled by the man himself. Everyone prayed for the elders to hold firm in their decisions regarding the abhorrent creature. Cheers could be heard throughout the entire realm as the thing stood with its back to the crowd of jeering angels. The boy grit his teeth at the mocking voices telling him to get it over with and jump already. He could hear some screaming for the elders to cut his wings off and let him drop, and he rolled his eyes at the notion. My wings would just grow back, you cretins, he thought bitterly, not like it hasn't already been tried and tested. Tuning out the boisterous crowd, he turned and plucked a feather from one of his wings. The black and gold speckled feather turned into a wispy vestige and transformed as he summoned his bow. The crowd silenced as he drew the shadowy string back, giving a smile as an arrow formed. The crowd gasped, making his smile stretch wider. He unfurled his massive black wings and released the arrow with a loud snap. Before dropping backwards from the bridge, the crowd panicked and scattered as the arrow was caught by a guarding angel, who apparently wasn't too well informed on heaven's most problematic child. Run, someone shouted to the guard, but it was already too late. As soon as the arrow was caught, it fizzled from existence and a small black hole opened up in its place. The guard panicked, trying to fly away, all to no avail. He would have been sucked in had God not snapped his fingers and rightened Izuku's little goodbye present. If there was one thing anyone knew, it was not to fuck with the Deku if God wasn't within the vicinity. There was always hell to pay when that little demon was up and running amok. 
The crowd quietened after realizing what God had done. The screaming and frantic flying had stopped, and the angels looked at one another for a moment before hollers of praise erupted from the crowd. Finally, someone shouted, Good riddance. Another joined in. And don't ever come back. There were cheers as everyone realized that wretched Deku's final attack would have no lasting damage. For once, the only person who didn't look happy was God himself. The large visage of a giant man sighed, not taking his eyes off the spot his young angel had just leapt from. I wish you luck, my angel of the void. Izuku sped through the rift between realms, his wings useless as he fell to earth. While he plummeted towards the clouds, he thought about how anticlimactic everything had been. Sure, he'd fired an arrow from one of his void weapons, but he knew it would do no real harm. I mean, come on. God was sitting right there. After all, he thought to himself as red tears gathered in his eyes from the wind. He closed them against the flowing torrent of the atmosphere and covered his face with an arm, all while trying in vain to get his wings to work properly. Maybe this is a good thing. Anyway, none of the angels had ever liked Izuku. He'd been an anomaly since the day he was created. He was different and would therefore be hated for it for all of eternity. Because while all the other angels had white, straight hair, Izuku's was black and curly. While all the other angels had white and golden eyes, with no separation in the pupils, Izuku's were vanta black, with golden flecks that danced and spun when he felt strong emotions. While all the other angels had white and gold wings, Izuku's were black with bright golden specks that shimmered at the tips. And while all the other angels were loved by God, Izuku was hated, not only by God himself but by everyone. He'd always been an outcast. None of the other angels had ever talked to him aside from when he was causing havoc. When they did speak to him, it was to cuss him out, always calling him names like Unholy, Demon, and his least favorite, Deku, among many other things. Deku was the name he'd been called for as long as he could remember, the name he had always hated and despised. No one called him that to his face unless God was around to do damage control, though. He smiled to himself at the thought despite the freezing wind sending pinbricks of pain throughout his body. His smile fell when he realized he'd never again step foot in the heavenly plane, that he was as good as dead by that point. Frowning under the arm shielding his face, Izuku thought that he couldn't, shouldn't, care less by that point. They may hate him, but he despised them. From the name calling to the experiments and torture done by the elders all in the name of righteousness, each of them could go die in the demon realm for all he cared. Yeah, this is definitely a good thing. And would it be too much to ask that he turns into a mortal and dies from his fall to earth? Probably. He uncovered his face and opened his stinging eyes in time to see he was closing in on the ground. With his enhanced vision, he could see a pair of mortals directly below him sitting outside a large house. He prayed that he didn't crush them as he once again squeezed his eyes shut, desperately trying to get his wings to just fucking cooperate. After another moment of falling, he heard the people shouting something, but he couldn't make out what the tumultuous clamor of voices was about. Before he even had a chance to decipher what they were yelling about, he violently crashed into the ground. He heard the sickening snap and squelch of bones snapping and flesh flying as he landed. And after a beat of stunned silence, someone screamed. That was the last thing he heard as his mind caught up with his body and his nerves exploded in a world of pain. He surrendered to the agony that surged through him and let the darkness clouding his vision take over as he lost consciousness. Izuku doesn't care what anyone says. God is a complete fucking dick. All I'm saying is that you and Hisashi would make amazing fathers, Nimuri told Shout a matter-of-factly as she sipped on her drink. She looked towards the rising sun as the man sitting beside her on the porch groaned. Shouta had to fight the urge to pinch the bridge of his nose. Got him it, we've been over this already. It's not about whether or not we'd be good at it, Nimiri. Did you hear a word of what Hisashi has been saying? His face turned sour as he recalled some of the fights he and his husband had gotten into over the past few months. My sleep schedule is messed up enough as it is, and he wants to adopt a baby. A crying, fussing baby. Do you know what kind of hell on earth that would be for me? Think about how much worse off my sleep schedule would be then. Nimiri paused, narrowing her eyes thoughtfully. Then why don't you meet in the middle? Adopt an older kid. Six or seven. Hell, maybe even eight or nine. She glanced towards Shouta, but he refused to meet her gaze. The whole thing was, quite frankly, ridiculous if you asked him. Nimuri, we have so little time on our hands as it is. Why would I want to waste what precious time I do have looking after some more than likely traumatized orphan? He grumbled, voice rough. Nimuri frowned and considered his words for a moment. But you know how badly Hizashi wants this, Shu. Even if it's not a baby, you should at least look into it. Nimuri fidgeted with the straw in her sparkling lemon water as she spoke. She didn't know what to say to convince him. If his Ashi, the love of his life, couldn't, how on earth would she? Listen, I know you're just trying to help. I understand that. But I get enough of this from his Ashi, along with the incessant nagging from everyone else in my immediate family. He paused and let out a huff. I've probably heard enough of this from just about everyone, actually. He muttered. At this point, the only way I'd ever adopt a child is if God himself asked me to. 
and seeing as to how I don't believe in all that shit, it's not going to happen. Nimiri's shoulders slumped at his words. She knew it was probably a lost cause by this point, but she continued regardless. So, if say, God came to you in a dream, she muttered to herself. Shouta groaned and finally turned in his chair to face her. You are not sneaking Mako into my house and having her influence my dreams again. I'm already traumatized enough from when you forced her to make me dream about waking up in my bed as a cat. Nimiri chuckled, remembering a few of the spectacular phrases muttered by Shouta during that particular prank. Mako and her dream-controlling quirk were a godsend. Nimiri's face then morphed into something more serious as she said, I just wish you'd at least consider the possibility. Shouta's eyes narrowed into slits. Can we please just talk about something else? He asked. His voice was as monotone as ever, but there was a hint of desperation Nimiri had only heard a handful of times before. Nimiri was silent for a moment, debating on whether or not she should continue torturing him or if she should just drop it. With a steely determination for Hizashi's sake, she opened her mouth and prepared to continue on her tirade to make one of her best friend's dreams finally become a reality. Before she could speak, however, her thoughts were cut off by a loud whistling sound. She and Shouta glanced at one another, bewildered, before they both looked around, seeing nothing within their general vicinity. Both pairs of eyes turned skywards, where they locked onto the bright, golden light that was hurtling towards them at high speed. Holy shit, Nimari cried. What the hell is that? Shouta would have liked to know as well, but he didn't have a clue. They stepped away from the porch, rushing towards the door. But before they could enter the house, Nimari had frozen. Because as the object got closer, she recognized it as a person. Shouta, wait. She hollered, grabbing his arm. Shouta froze, his hand still clutching the handle of the porch's sliding glass door. We need to get inside, Nimuri. Now, Shouta barked. The dark-haired woman shook her head frantically. She didn't know what to do, how she could stop this person from smashing into the ground at such high speed. Surely, surely it will kill them, she thought. It's a person. She ran down the steps, watching as the person with large black wings got closer and closer to the ground. What are you doing? Shouta shouted, rushing after her. He grabbed her around the middle and held her in his arms, preventing her from getting any closer to where the person would crash land. We have to help them. She cried. They were both at a loss for what to do. The person was hurtling closer and closer to the ground with every second. The pair could see them desperately trying to gain control of what appeared to be two black wings. However, it was clear to see that they were failing. Shit, Shouta cursed. Nimuri, there's nothing we can do. They're trying to gain control of their flight. All we can manage is to hope they succeed. He began to haul her up the steps as she fought in his grip. She couldn't just sit by and do nothing. That person would die. There had to be something, anything she could do. Searching her surroundings, Nimuri sought a possible object to break the person's fall. However, even if there had been something convenient lying around, it most likely wouldn't have helped much with the speed at which they were plummeting. What are you doing? Shouta shouted. She turned away from the falling person to look at him heatedly. He returned her gaze with worry. What are you going to do, catch them? He asked incredulously. No, but, but there's gotta be something we can do. Nimuri quickly looked back to the person with the wing quirk, just in time to see them hit the ground. She froze in shock. After a beat, she let out an ear-piercing scream as blood and flesh shot into the air and coated both people standing close by. No, she cried out. The person, who was now a bloodied, split-open mess on the ground, was most definitely dead. Bones and gore painted the crater where he'd fallen, the person a heap of splattered flesh and shattered bones. The sight was nausea-inducing, but Nimuri couldn't tear her eyes away. Holy, holy shit, she muttered. Shouta took one look at the broken, crumpled corpse on the grass and quickly turned away. He took Nimuri's head in his hands and turned her face away from the carnage as well. There was nothing we could have done to stop that from happening, he said quickly, forcing her head to stay in place so she didn't look back at the mangled corpse. Okay, this wasn't your fault, it wasn't mine. It was an unexpected accident. It's okay, you're okay, he told her. Nimiri's eyes, while dry, were wild and full of panic. Shouta was still forcing her to look at him as she tried to glance back at the body. Don't look, Shouta said. We could have, we should have, Nimiri began quickly. Shouta shook his head to silence her. God, how did things take such an unsightly turn so quickly? He thought, also quite shaken from what they'd just witnessed. There was nothing we could have done, he assured her. Neither of our quirks was suited to help them. That was going to happen no matter what we did. But, there was nothing we could have done, Nem, Shouta repeated. We should go inside and phone the police. Get you calmed down, Shouta added, looking at her in concern. Nimuri nodded her head jerkily and Shouta slowly released his hands from her face. The second he let go so she turned back towards the corpse. Nimuri, please, Shouta all but begged. While Shouta refused to give in to the urge to get another look at the corpse, he watched Nimuri's eyebrows knit together and her face turned from desolate and disturbed to confused and hopeful. 
Bemused, Shouta took the trauma-inducing risk of looking at the corpse and glanced to the grass beyond the porch steps. There, on the ground surrounded by a black, wispy smoke-like substance, the body was healing itself. Dual quirks, Shouta wondered. Bones began twisting to righten themselves and wet, squelching snaps could be heard from where the pair stood. The blood that stained the grass began to emit the same type of dark smoke that surrounded the boy's body, and a groan could be heard from the person on the ground as their skin knitted itself back together. Holy shit, Nimari muttered once again, uncomprehending of what she was witnessing. She ripped herself free of her best friend's hold and ran to the person, the boy, by the looks of it, and fell to her knees on the grass. Are you okay? She asked quickly, but the boy had yet to wake up, let alone respond. Check for a pulse, Shouta demanded. He wouldn't admit it to anyone but himself, but the entire situation had him on edge. Yeah, yes, Nimiri responded, shakily reaching up to the boy's non-mangled, non-bloody throat and pressing two quivering fingers over his pulse point. Well, Shouta asked after a moment, looking hopeful, he's... Nimiri choked on her words in shock before continuing. He's alive, she said, completely dumbfounded. Shouta hid his shock behind a neutral expression. After a moment of silence passed, he muttered to himself, what an amazing quirk, to not only have such impressive wings but to also be able to heal from such grievous injuries. Truly incredible, Nimiri shot him an incredulous look over her shoulder. Seriously, a boy, no older than 13 or 14, by the looks of it, falls out of the sky, breaking just about every bone in his body in the process, and the only thing you can think about is how incredible his quirk is, she admonished severely. Shouta mumbled something about the fact that the boy was alive, wasn't he? but could see her point. You're right, he said, acknowledging her concern while Nimiri checked the boy over. I'll call an ambulance. He then sped into the house and grabbed his phone from where it had been charging. He dialed 119 and put the phone to his ear, waiting as the phone rang. 119, what is your emergency? A voice answered as the call connected. I need an ambulance at X Street, house number 30. A boy was flying overhead and crash landed in my backyard. He has a wing quirk and some kind of healing quirk. He was in pretty rough shape initially but managed to heal. We, uh, we think he's okay, but he's unconscious. Emergency services will be on the way shortly, sir, the voice replied. Shouta called his ashy from the hospital. He was doing his radio show and was freaked out when his husband started with I'm in the emergency room. But he quickly calmed when he realized it wasn't Shouta or Nimari who had gotten hurt. Shouta briefly explained the situation and his ashy decided he'd sign off of the broadcast a bit earlier than initially planned to go comfort his husband and closest friend. When the voice hero made it to the hospital and rushed through the halls to where Shouta and Nimiri were waiting outside her room, a doctor was already explaining that the child was perfectly unharmed and should wake up at any moment now. Shoo! Hazashi cried as the group turned to the source of the noise. Oh, thank God. You're here. Shouta turned to his husband as the man embraced him. The doctor looked a bit put off by their PDA but said nothing on the matter. Instead, he continued with what he had been saying before being interrupted by Hazashi's arrival. While the boy is perfectly uninjured as of right now, he has extensive and major scarring all along his body. Oddly enough, the scars are golden in color, though that could be due to his quirk. The man's face then darkened, and the trio awaited his next words with nervous dread. Along with the visible scarring, we did some x-rays to make sure there was no lasting damage from the fall. What we found is disturbing, to say the least. The man cleared his throat, looking over the boy's chart with distaste before continuing. It is clear that he has sustained many broken bones in the past, with some looking to have been broken multiple times. Some breaks are in the same place, as well. The three pro heroes only stared at the doctor in stunned silence. But he's, he's okay. Nimiri asked cautiously. The doctor gave her a solemn look. Physically, yes. A pause. Mentally, we'll have to wait until he wakes up. Nimiri nodded her head a bit shakily at his response. She just hoped the kid was alright. We'll also have to see about contacting his guardians at some point. The detective you called should be able to get some information out of him. He paused thoughtfully. As I told you earlier, I predict he will wake up within the next half an hour or so. Thank you, Dr. Kobayashi. We'll do everything we can to help the kid, Shouta said. The doctor gave a slight nod. Of course, I will keep you informed until we get a hold of his parents or guardian. For now, I have other patients I must attend to. Dr. Kobayashi gave a small sigh and they all watched as the man turned and walked away. Hazashi waited until the man was out of earshot before speaking. What exactly happened? No one is hurt, at least anymore, right? He asked quietly as he subtly checked Shouta and Nimiri over for any visible injury or harm with his eyes. We're okay, calm down, Shouta said with a fond eye roll. Apparently Hazashi wasn't being as subtle as he thought he was. It's just as I explained on the phone. Everything's fine. Shouta ran a hand through his long, unruly hair as he looked at the door leading to where the boy from earlier was lying unconscious on a hospital bed. Nimiri and I were talking on the porch when all of a sudden a child fell from the sky. But he's okay. 
Hizashi asked worriedly. Shouta and Nimari nodded their heads in unison. They knew Hizashi had just heard firsthand that the boy was fine. But he'd always been a worrywart when it came to children. You should have seen it, Zashi. He was a mess. I, I was terrified. Nimiri recalled with a shudder, haunted by the memory of a broken body and split open flesh, the sound of bones snapping and blood splattering against the dirt and grass. Then all of a sudden he began healing like nothing ever happened, like regenerating after being violently smashed against the ground doesn't completely defy all logic and reason she wouldn't admit it. But the situation had her perplexed, unable to wrap her head around how he was okay. There was only one thing she knew for certain. That boy, that boy should be dead. If I didn't know any better, I'd say he was genuinely immortal. Nimiri shook her head at the thought, unable to understand it. Was it even possible to have such a powerful quirk? Hizashi looked at her with wide eyes. Is a quirk like that even possible? He asked, echoing her thoughts. Nimiri glanced away from him, looking thoughtful for a moment. She wouldn't have thought it to be conceivable before witnessing it for herself, but what she'd seen, the way his body had been so irreparably broken. I'm not sure, but there's no way he should have been able to heal from that the way he did, she muttered quietly, so no one else in the hall would hear her. I brushed off what Shouta said when he first healed, but he was right, he has an amazing quirk. Not only does he have massive wings, but he can also heal from what I assume to be any injury. It's truly something to behold, she said in a hushed tone. Any injury? Do you really think that? Hisashi asked, incredulous. Yes. Nimiri grabbed Hisashi by the shoulders, face worried and guarded but eyes alight with excitement. Just think of what kind of hero he could become with a dual quirk like that, she muttered, eyes practically sparkling at the thought. Whoa, whoa, shout a cut in. Let's not go making plans for this kid yet. We don't even know who his parents are, or what he wants, shout a told her. Nimiri frowned. Shouta was always shooting down her ideas like that, but she was used to it. She was also used to fighting him on it. But if he wanted to be a hero, one of us could give him a recommendation to Yui, we could. Nimiri, Shouta scolded and Nimiri pouted. But just think of the potential, Shu, he could probably even surpass all M, before she could finish what she was saying. However, an ungodly wail echoed throughout the hospital's bare walls, causing them to wince and cover their ears. What is that? Hazashi shouted, but no one could hear even him over the loud cry. The screeching continued for only a few more seconds. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the sound stopped. Holy shit, Hazashi said, bemused. That was louder than my quirk, for God's sake. What was that? But before either Nimiri or Shouta could respond, the door to the boy's hospital room shot open, and the boy stepped through. All three of them paused at the sight of his eyes and the golden scars that decorated his exposed skin. They watched him pause at the sight of them, saw the way his giant wings seemed to twitch as if he were intimidated by the small group. Where the fuck am I, and what am I wearing? He asked in a language none of them understood while he gestured to the plain hospital gown draped along his thin frame. His voice sounded unnatural, like many voices layered over one another as he spoke. It was frightening to hear at first, but there was also something almost ethereal about it. He looked towards the trio ahead of him, taking a threatening step forward. Answer me, mortals, he bellowed, trying to mask his fear and confusion with anger. None of them knew what he was saying, let alone how to react. The boy stared at them for a moment longer before looking around. Where in the mortal plane am I? He asked, looking more and more scared by the second. Kid, calm down, Hizashi said gently. The boy gazed at him assessingly for a moment. The gold of his eyes began to spin around rapidly, and he looked slightly shocked. Japanese, he asked, this time with more surprise than false bravado and anger in his tone. His voice had also changed from the unnatural seraphim choir-like lull to something more normal-sounding. His accent was nearly perfect but at the same time strange. It wasn't one any of them had ever heard before, but the alluring lilt was somehow enticing. The gold flecks in his eyes were spinning around more languidly now, and it would be beautiful if all three of them weren't scared shitless. Nimiri, whose heart had nearly given out at the sight of him after such an unholy sound, was the next to speak. Yes, Japanese. Do you know the language? She asked cautiously. What in God's name is going on? She wondered. Yes, I know every language of mortals such as yourselves. They are all quite simple to grasp. How you aren't all multilingual is a mystery to me, the kid said matter-of-factly. The trio looked at one another, not understanding what he meant. Okay, Isashi muttered. Do you want to go inside your room and speak properly? There's a detective on his way here to speak with you. He will be here shortly. Isashi took a small step towards him, but the boy only staggered back. Stay away. He screamed in that strange language. Hazashi, while not understanding exactly what the kid was saying, got the message and took a step away. Where the fuck are the hospital staff when you need them? Shouta muttered dryly, unamused. Of course the kid who crash landed in their backyard had to be some foreigner lunatic with a powerful quirk. I can always just make him unable to use his wings. Shouta grumbled internally. 
We're not going to hurt you, okay, kiddo? Nimari said slowly, raising her hands placatingly to show she wasn't a threat. Tell that to the last angel who was exiled to Earth, the boy spat. They endured decades of torture at the hands of the American government before they were finally put out of their misery. He muttered darkly, Okay, so definite headcase, then, shout a thought in bewilderment. All right, all right, we're not like them, got it? No torture, no, putting anyone out of their misery. We just want to talk, Hazashi tried to console, sensing the child may be unwell in the head. The boy looked at him assessingly. He reached a hand up to his chest as if he could feel something there before he conceded and nodded his head. All right, he muttered. But I warn you, I am not like the others. His eyes narrowed as he spoke, a dangerous edge in his voice. My abilities are far more complicated, far more powerful. One step out of line and it's your head on the floor, your blood at my feet. Holy shit, this kid is terrifying, Hazashi thought, glancing at Shouta nervously. The man simply shook his head and returned to his anxious gaze, watching the boy curl his wings behind his back as he re-entered the hospital room. His quirks are those wings in healing, and he doesn't have any weapons on his person, Nimari checked. We'll be fine, Shouta assured Hizashi and Nimari quietly before hurriedly following after the unnamed boy. The boy was already sitting on the bed when they entered the room. We'll wait for Detective Tsukachi to get here. That way you can be questioned properly, Shouta said as he eyed the boy wearily. He didn't know what else to say. The boy smirked at them, though he looked a bit nauseous. Nonetheless, the smirk caused the group discomfort as it only added to their nerves. What? Shouta asked. Not liking the shit-eating grin spread across his face. Even so, something told him it was merely a mask the boy was wearing. He could tell by the way his eyes swirled continuously. The way his wings twitched every so often, the way he was slightly curled in on himself, his arms laid across his stomach and his shoulders hunched. If you knew anything about body language, which Shouta did, it was easy to see how anxious the boy truly was. You are afraid of me, the boy once again said matter-of-factly. Well, you two are. You think there is a possibility that I could overpower you, he clarified, pointing towards Hizashi and Nimiri, which I easily could. Shouta went to speak, but Izuku put up a hand to stop him, effectively silencing the man. Shouta opened his mouth to object regardless but found that he couldn't. Shocked by the possibility of a third quirk, but still level-headed, he used his own quirk on the boy. His eyes glowed red and his hair began to float upwards as he tried once more to force sound past his lips, blinking in confusion as he opened and closed his mouth. He found his speech was still blocked. Is this not his quirk? Is there someone else here? But a much more terrifying thought came to mind soon afterwards. Or, does my quirk not work on him? He wondered. It's rude to interrupt people, the boy said lowly while looking at Shouta. His husband and best friend's faces morphed into ones of bewilderment. He hasn't said a word. So why? Nimari thought as they both turned their attention to Shouta, shocked to see him using his quirk when there was no visible threat. Then again, he sometimes did it to intimidate people. The man continued glaring assessingly at the boy, still trying to use his quirk. As Ashi went to speak, but the boy dismissively waved him off, continuing before he could so much as open his mouth. As I was saying... This one, he then gestured to Shouta, was slightly concerned. But now he's just confused and a tad bit nervous. His grin widened at his own observation. Then again, you're all feeling that way. I have to wonder about the concern part, though. Is it because you watched me fall from the very heavens themselves? He asked, eyes flickering as he placed his elbows on his cross legs and rested his chin in the palm of his hand slyly. We aren't. Nimiri cleared her throat, trying to make her words sound more confident than she really was. We aren't scared of you, she told him. Really? The boy asked, once again reaching towards his chest. Because I can feel other people's emotions. And the moment I talked about rolling heads and spilled blood, I could feel just the smallest prickle of fear from all of you. He informed them. But with Hobo over here, those feelings quickly went away when he told you and Blondie that he had searched me for weapons. Though they've returned now that I've taken away his ability to speak. His smile vanished, his face twisting into a cold and grim expression. On a side note, if you honestly think angels don't have celestial weaponry, you're only fooling yourselves. Finally finished speaking he lowered his hand, effectively returning Shouta's ability to talk. You may speak. Nimuri and Asashi turned to stare at Shouta in shock, finally having put two and two together and realizing what the boy had done. Is that why Shu used his quirk? Asashi wondered. But then why didn't he speak after using it? How many quirks do you have, kid? Shouta asked, interrupting Hisashi's train of thought. Everyone in the room was slowly starting to look more and more nervous at the amount of quirks the boy was showing. Shouta thought that the boy may have simply been reading their facial expressions and body language for that last one. But the description of Shouta's emotions, and most likely Nimuri and Hisashi's, too, had been spot on. Not to mention the fact that he'd shown three quirks already. If not four by cancelling out Shouta's eraser quirk. 
which makes five altogether. Quirks? Izuku asked dumbly, looking genuinely bemused. What are quirks? The trio didn't answer. They only stared at him shocked and incredulous. Just what is going on here? Shouta wondered. Is this some sort of ruse? Carefully assessing the situation, Shouta thought about what kind of individual this kid could be. All the possibilities spun around his mind. Everything from the boy being certifiably insane to the possibility of him being a villain. After all, it may have been more than a coincidence that he'd fallen into two pro heroes' backyard. Before Shouta could ask any further questions, however, there was a knock at the door. The man eyed the kid for another moment before slowly turning towards the door and opening it. Ah, Detective Tsukachi. What good timing, Shouta said, glad to be saved by someone who could likely get the answers they were looking for. Naomasa nodded and entered the room before promptly stopping in his tracks at the sight of the boy. His mouth fell open at the kid's wings, eyes, and the golden marks covering his body. Something was disturbing, yet at the same time, beautiful, about them. I've never seen a mutation like this before, he thought to himself in astonishment. He gulped and closed his mouth, promptly shaking off the boy's strange appearance. Hello, I am Detective Tsukachi from the Musutafu Police Department. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Oh, this one's intrigued. The boy cooed. By my appearance, I'm guessing. Naomasa coughed and cleared his throat, attempting to regain composure. I'm not sure if feeling my emotions is part of your quirk, but yes, your appearance is very intriguing. He smiled down at the boy who frowned at him with a quizzical expression. I still don't know what a quirk is, but go ahead and ask your questions, Detective Tsukachi. Shouta looked at the man, who went back to gaping. He quickly pulled out his notebook and drew a checkmark, indicating the boy was telling the truth about not knowing what quirks were. The boy could feel the shift of emotions in all of them, but couldn't piece together why just yet. Okay, we'll start simple, Naomasa said calmly. What is your name? The boy narrowed his eyes as if thinking. I think my name is Izuku, but it's been a while since I was actually called that. Everyone just calls me Deku. Naomasa seemed concerned by his words as he wrote another checkmark on his notepad. He wanted to ask for a last name but wasn't sure the boy even knew, judging by his previous response. Either way, he found the other matter more pressing. As in useless, he asked in a disgusted tone. Izuku glanced at him with a sorrowful expression on his face. Sort of, but not really, he muttered. Naomasa looked at the boy, noting the way the specks of gold in his otherwise dark eyes seemed to spin more rapidly at the confession. What does it mean, for you? He asked. It's a word used to describe an unholy being, someone who defies God and everything he stands for. In other words, a demon. Izuku muttered. Hazashi looked at Shota, mouthing the word cult. But Shouta shook his head, not knowing the answer. Izuku didn't notice what had transpired between the two as he looked to Naomasa and continued. If I wasn't being called Deku, I was being called things such as abomination, freak of nature, abhorrent, ungodly, sinful, you name it. Any horrible word you can think of, especially something meaning unholy, I've probably heard at least once. Izuku turned his gold-specked eyes away from them, unable to look at the group after admitting something so embarrassing. He may have been an angel in name, and he may have been more powerful than any of his kind. But, none of that mattered. To heaven, he was nothing more than a drop of water in a stormy cloud. They'd all patiently waited for the day it would finally rain and he'd fall to earth like the useless drop of water he was. Waited for him to be cast into the sea of nameless faces, abandoned and scorned, lost in the waves, never to return to those clouds again. Naomasa wrote another checkmark on his notepad page, not looking away from Izuku. And where do you come from, Izuku? The celestial realm, heaven, he replied solemnly, as if it were something he wasn't proud of. Naomasa stared at him, shocked. The room held their breath, all of them looking to either Izuku or Naomasa's notepad. The detective raised his hand, and with a shaky grip on his pen, he made another checkmark. The room was silent. Izuku could feel their shock but refused to speak on the matter as he thought about all he'd lost. If, if that's true. Naomasa paused for a moment, Izuku's words sinking in. Then why are you here? He asked. Izuku's face paled at the mention of his exile. Red tears gathered in his eyes, further cementing the possibility that he was, in fact, not of this world, because I'm not like everyone else. I'm, I'm different, he muttered. I wasn't born of the same celestial power as the other angels, and I was hated for it, not to mention the fact that none of my abilities are the same as the others. Sure, there are similarities, but, I've never been normal to them, to the angels, to the elders, to God. The bloody tears that had gathered in his eyes began to fall as he admitted to his faults. He wanted to say more, as he'd never really had anyone to talk to, no one who would listen. He may never see these people again, so what was the harm? For once, could he spill his heart out for someone, anyone, to hear? You know, he said after a moment, I didn't have one friend up there. Not a single angel treated me kindly. I was nothing more than a monster bred from sin to them. They all hated me. They laughed at me and threw harsh words at me every chance they got. 
I was always made fun of because of my black hair, eyes, and wings while they all had their perfect white and gold. There was not a day that went by where I prayed to that stupid oaf, God, to just get it over with and kill me already. The tears of blood began falling more rapidly from Izuku's eyes as he spoke. He wiped them away quickly, smearing the red liquid all over the palms of his hands. When I was a child, the other children used to rub it in my face that they got to go to school while I sat alone in my empty house reading those stupid books to fulfill my education. I hated being isolated, but I was always by myself. I was alone every single day. I had no one. No one ever loved me or cared about me. His body shook as he let out small keens while he cried. The way he cried was unusual. But if he really was an angel, that could be the reason his sobs were so different from what would be considered normal. So I started acting up. If I was causing trouble, at least someone would pay attention to me, if only for a little while. Is it so wrong of me to crave interaction? Bloody tears continued to build up in his eyes. But every time they got close to spilling over he'd wipe them away angrily. I was a kid. I'm still a kid. I've got millions of years ahead of me. And they just cast me out like I'm nothing. I'm not nothing. The only reason they hate me so much is because I'm stronger than them. It was fear that caused their hatred. Nothing else. And what does God do? Not a damn thing. He left me to rot, alone with my thoughts and useless prayers. Prayers to not be so alone. Prayers for a friend. Prayers for anything but the life I was fucking born into. But what does he do instead? He exiles me to this place, the accursed mortal plane, where sin is second nature to all. Because that's all I am. All I'll ever be. A sinner. By the time he had finished his rant, he was full on sobbing into his hands, the sound high and strange. He wanted to scream. He wanted to open a black hole that would swallow up the entire earth along with himself. I hate God. He howled, giving in to the urge. He turned his head skyward and threw his arms out to his sides, sending red specks of blood flying from his hands where they splattered against the wall. I hate him and everything he fucking stands for. The adults stood in stunned silence, not knowing what to say. Izuku felt their emotions, their concern and mortification at his words. He turned to them, eyes still leaking bloody tears. I'm sorry, he murmured. They turned to Tsukachi, who only nodded his head. He's telling the truth, he mouthed to them. They looked from Naomasa to Izuku, the silence in the room deafening after the boys, the angels, outburst. It's gonna be okay, kiddo, Hasashi said, taking a step toward Izuku. When the boy didn't react he took another, and another, until finally, he was sitting beside him. How can it be okay? I'm trapped in the mortal realm. I'm not worried about being kidnapped and experimented on like stupid Mackail was. But dear heavens now up above, what am I, what am I going to do? He sobbed. Hisashi wrapped his arms around the boy, who shook slightly in his hold as he keened. Nimuri turned to Shouta then, her stunned expression on full display. Shouta, Nimuri said carefully, watching as the exasperated man turned to her. What? He asked before looking away from the angel on the hospital bed. You said, you said you wouldn't adopt a kid unless God himself asked you to, right? Nimuri muttered lowly so neither Hazashi nor Izuku could hear her. Shouta's face morphed into a displeased expression as he frowned. It was obvious where this was going. Well, she said, I think he just asked. Notes, and that is chappy one. D what do you think? Let me know in the comments. I think I may have dropped some hints, but I'm curious to see if anyone caught on to why Izuku is so different and much more powerful than the other angels. Let me know what your theories are below. P. Also, if you have any suggestions for pairings with either Izuku or side pairings, let me know. I don't really know where I'm going with this and only write outlines for each new chapter if I write one at all because my chaotic brain is my outline. So if you want any tropes, plots, or arcs, just write them up in the comments. I have a vague idea of where to take this and a few things planned out. But I'd be happy to write in some suggestions that intrigue me. D. All that being said, I don't really have an update schedule, so expect things to be sporadic. I usually only write when inspiration hits, which is why I'm asking for prompts, plot lines from you guys. Also, even if you don't have any ideas, I reply to every comment I get on my fix. So expect a response if you decide to comment. Hope you enjoyed, and until next time, my gremlins. Lesser than 3. Chapter 2, In This World. Notes, here's a short chapter for you. I got too excited and couldn't stop writing, so you get a double update, even though this second chapter is only 2,800 words, and let it be said that I have no medical knowledge. A lot of the stuff in this chapter is shit ripped straight from my brain, and probably wouldn't fly IRL. But who needs real life when you have fanfiction? Anyway, enjoy the chappy, my gremlins. Double update. Edit. To help with the flow, I have also edited, updated this chapter along with the first one. Chapter text. Shouta stared at Nimuri, an incredulous look on his face. You cannot be serious. He said lowly so Izuku wouldn't hear him. You said, she began, but Shouta cut her off. I know what I said. He glanced to where his husband was trying to calm the keening boy down before he pinched the bridge of his nose wearily. 
He gestured to the door, signaling for them to take the conversation into the hall. As soon as the pair had exited the room, Nimari began her rant. Shouta, if this isn't a sign from God himself, I don't know what is. Nimari huffed as soon as the door clicked shut behind her friend. Shouta raised an eyebrow and gave her an unimpressed look. Is she really this naive? He thought in exasperation. Shouta, you. No, he interrupted. We don't know who he is, where he came from, or what he's doing here. We don't even know if he's telling the truth. Can you honestly look me in the eye and tell me you believe that he's an angel, Nimiri? His brain was going a mile a minute as he thought up plausible scenarios as to why the boy may truly be there. None of them looked good. Of course I believe him. Sukachi used his quirk. Everything he said was true. Nimiri gave Shouta a pleading look, almost as though she were begging for him to understand. She knew it was unbelievable, but she had a gut feeling. And my gut feelings are never wrong. Maybe to him. Shouta's eyes narrowed as he thought. He could have been brainwashed by some cult. It wouldn't be the first time. Shouta thought back to all the horror stories he'd heard. He was more inclined to believe that the boy had gotten those injuries in a cult as opposed to heaven. Then how do you explain everything we saw, both at your house and in that room? Her eyes were lit with determination as she spoke fervently. Shouta shook his head, but she ignored him and plowed on. His appearance, multiple quirks, the ability to heal from such grievous injuries. Can't you just accept that maybe there is something greater than simply living your life and then being thrown into endless nothingness? She implored, searching for a way to bridge the gap between Shouta's disbelief and the unexplainable. Shouta closed his eyes, inhaling a long breath. As he exhaled slowly, he said, I have another theory, but you're not going to like it. Pausing, he looked at Nimiri, who gestured for him to continue. There's a strong possibility that he's a villain, he muttered darkly. Nimiri gave him a skeptical and somewhat enraged look as she scoffed at his words. A villain, she hissed. Do I have to spell it out for you? Sukachi used his quirk on him. Everything he said was the truth, at least to him, anyway. Even if he's not an angel, even if he's been brainwashed by a cult, I don't see how you could make the jump to villainy. Shouta looked around to be sure no one was listening in on their conversation before glancing back at Nimiri, finding her visibly afflicted by his words. She'd always grown attached quickly, especially to the younger generation. He didn't doubt that after hearing the boy's sob story she had become emotionally invested. That's why Shouta had been worried she would react like this, but his theory held merit. He didn't just come up with the notion out of nowhere. Think about this seriously for a moment, Nimiri, Shouta muttered lowly. Her livid expression didn't change, but she didn't show any signs of stopping what he was about to say, either. His appearance could be a very rare mutation-type quirk. As for the detective, he easily stopped me from using my quirk, so who's to say he can't do the same to Tsukachas? His eyes narrowed, thinking along those lines, there's a good chance that he's able to manipulate quirks. He took a moment to let the information sink in before he gave the big revelation. Now, think about it. Who do we know that can give people multiple quirks? The look on Nimiri's face shifted as she paled. She knew exactly who he meant. That, that's not, she spluttered. Why would all for one? She glanced to the hospital room door nervously, unable to believe what she was hearing. Her face twisted up slightly, the information like a punch to the gut. Regardless, it's possible, she admitted. In today's world, anything is. Shouta nodded his head, glad she was finally seeing his side of things. But that's also why I'd like to be able to believe in him, Shouta. What you're saying, it's, it's not a stretch. But why would he show off his powers? Why would he give us a reason to doubt him? Surely if he was working with all for one, he'd have a better plan. He wouldn't ruin everything the second he woke up. Shouta glanced at her, the gravity of the situation weighing heavily on him. We need to proceed with caution, Nimiri. If there's even a slight chance that he's involved with all for one, we can't afford to underestimate the threat. Nimiri shook her head in disagreement. I understand, but we can't just jump to conclusions without hard evidence, either. Can't you just believe in something good for once? Shouta sighed heavily and shook his head. But, he guessed that if he wanted her to see his side of things, he'd have to try seeing hers, as well. Fine, he conceded. But we're not just going to let this slide, either. She gave a determined nod. Thank you, Shouta. Hisashi watched as Nimiri and Shouta silently exited the room to talk in the hall. He'd seen what looked to be the beginning of an argument and was glad they were leaving the room to diffuse whatever tension was building up between them. Izuku didn't seem to notice the pair slip out of the room, as he was too busy keening into his hands to pay attention. I just hate my life so much, he sobbed brokenly. What have I done to deserve this? Izuku's body shook with the force of his sobs, blood oozing from between his fingers due to the sheer amount of tears streaming from his eyes. Namasa winced as Hizashi continued rubbing soothing circles into the young angel's back. The detective didn't know what to say to make the boy feel better, something he was usually good at. The entire situation was a little, okay, very, jarring, so sue him for being at a loss for words. Instead, he took a seat beside Izuku, hoping his presence would be of even a little help. 
He reached his hand out and placed it on Izuku's shoulder as the boy leaned into the touch. It made Naomasa feel slightly better about his lack of ability to soothe him verbally. While Naomasa was at a loss for what to say, Hizashi had taken those few moments to gather his thoughts. He rubbed his hand along Izuku's knobby spine a few more times before he took in a deep breath. Izuku, he started, his voice gentle. You're not at fault for what you've been through, okay? The circumstances of your birth, whatever they are. It's not something you brought upon yourself. It's not something you can change or choose. You've been through a lot, I bet. But for now, just try looking toward the future. That's all any of us can hope to do in situations like these, Hazashi said as another high-pitched keen escaped past Izuku's throat, but he continued on unperturbed. You've said you were always alone before, right? He asked. Izuku sobbed a few more times in that strange high whine before nodding his head. His eyes squeezed together tightly. Well, I won't let you be alone like that ever again, he said. We're going to help you. We won't let you suffer any longer. We will save you. Izuku paused, his cries slowly dying down as he tried to understand the meaning behind Hizashi's words. He opened his eyes and peered up at the man through his hands, face hopeful. Why would you want to help me? He asked slowly. Well, I know you don't know what quirks are, but Shouta, Nimiri and I are pro-heroes. Hizashi gave Izuku a reassuring smile. And that's just what heroes do. So, you don't hate me. He muttered quietly, the gold flecks in his eyes spinning rapidly as his heart sped in anticipation of the answer. Azashi smiled softly at the boy, giving him a shake of the head. How could I possibly hate you, Izuku? You've done nothing wrong. Izuku's mouth fell open as he tried to form a response to that, trying to find something to say. He wanted to refute it, wanted to tell this man every horrible thing he'd done in heaven all in the hopes of getting even an ounce of the other angels' attention. Instead, more tears filled his eyes as he looked up at the man. They weren't tears of fear, anger, or hurt. They were tears of relief, something he'd never experienced before. The emotion flooded his chest, a feeling he'd only ever felt through someone else. His face contorted into an expression of vulnerability at the revelation as he stared at his ashy. The blonde looked at him in concern and Izuku gave a small shake of his head, able to sense his unease. He wiped at his face. I think, Izuku paused, not knowing how to tell the mortal what he was thinking without it being too embarrassing. I just feel relieved, is all, he muttered as he ducked his head bashfully. I'm glad. Hizashi's smile returned just as Nimuri and Shouta decided to finally make a reappearance. Nimuri grinned at the teen while Shouta frowned. Izuku looked at the black-haired man wearily, the spinning gold flecks in his eyes slowing down. He reached his hand up to his chest as he'd done earlier, grasping at the fabric of his hospital gown as he said, You don't trust me. Why? Shouta showed no reaction to the question while Hizashi and Nimuri fought the urge to facepalm. As Ashi stood and walked up to his husband quickly. Shouta, I just calmed him down. Why don't you go get some coffee? He said quietly. Shouta looked between Nimiri. Hizashi and Izuku weighing his options. If he is working for all for one, he could attack at any moment. It would be better to have all the manpower we can get. I'd rather stay. He drawled, eyeing Izuku cautiously from across the room. Izuku didn't say anything, but he looked genuinely put out by the emotions he felt coming from Shouta. The angel glanced away, obviously uncomfortable. At that, Shouta's expression softened minutely. It's possible, in today's world, anything is. But that's also why I'd like to be able to believe in him, Shouta. Nimiri's words from just a few moments ago echoed in his mind, and he cursed himself for getting soft. There was nothing else they could do but wait and see what would come of this. Doctor, Hiro shouted as she ran up to Dr. Kobayashi's table in the cafeteria. Miss Iyazaki, the man said, looking startled. Can't you see I'm on break? He asked, but the way she was fidgeting made him slightly nervous. What's wrong? He asked. The, the blood tests for your patient, Dr. Kobayashi. I've never seen anything like it before. She was bouncing from foot to foot now, wearing an expression of both astonishment and nervous excitement. You have to see it. Can't this wait? Kobayashi asked, though even he was intrigued by the sudden turn of events on his otherwise uneventful lunch break. You have to see this right now. She insisted, her urgency palpable. Kobayashi glanced at his sandwich before putting it on the table. Oh, what the hell? Why not? And with that, the pair hurriedly departed from the cafeteria. Shouta was watching Nimuri groom Izuku's wings when someone began knocking on the door frantically. Izuku jumped slightly at the sound, the action not going unnoticed by the three pro heroes and detective in the room. After all, they were trained to look for behaviors like that. Eventually, it just becomes second nature. Shouta got up from his chair with a bemused expression, crossing the room quickly. He opened the door, only to be met with the faces of Izuku's doctor and a girl he didn't recognize. Is there a reason you're banging on the door so obnoxiously? He asked. Where was the professionalism he'd seen earlier? Aizawa, sir, there's something you should see. Dr. Kobayashi spoke quickly. Shouta hid his confusion as he glanced back at Hizashi. You good if I step out with Izuku's doctor for a moment? He asked. Hizashi gave his husband a thumbs up and a yeah. 
which was much more subdued than usual, probably for Izuku's sake. Shouta gave a nod and followed the doctor out into the hallway. What is this about? He asked as Dr. Kobayashi and Kiro led him down the halls. You should see for yourself, sir, Kiro said. Shouta could feel a headache coming on as they continued down the hall. Shouta was silent as the two people ahead of him chattered quietly as they walked. He tried to discern what they were saying, but couldn't hear a word due to them speaking so low. He wasn't sure whether or not he should ask them more questions, or if he even wanted to in the first place, so instead he stayed silent. After walking for a few moments, the two hospital staff came to a halt outside of a room with two large doors. Shouta glanced at the sign above the entrance, where the words blood testing were written in bold letters. What are we doing here? Shouta wondered. Dr. Kobayashi opened the door and led them inside. As I explained earlier, I drew some blood from Izuku to make sure there was no clotting in the bloodstream after receiving such extensive damage to his body, the doctor said before looking at Kiro to pick up where he'd left off. I centrifuged the blood sample. Centrifugation is a process that separates the blood into its different components. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma, Kiro began, but I found something odd. Very odd. She pulled up a chart on her tablet and showed it to Shouta whose eyes scanned the screen. What am I looking at here? He asked, not understanding what the big deal was. This, she pointed towards two repeating letters on the screen, a small list of N, a S at the bottom. Shouta stared at her in bemusement, not understanding where this was going. Not available? What does that mean? He asked. Kiro shook her head. At first, I was puzzled too. I could have written it off as some sort of glitch in the system, but it's never happened before. Setting the tablet aside, she pulled out a vial containing Izuku's blood from the collection tube on the large table. Curious, I examined the blood under a microscope, and that's when I realized something. She used one of the blood pipettes from the same table to draw a small amount of Izuku's blood from the vial. She grabbed a microscope slide and hovered the pipette over it, allowing a drop of the liquid to fall onto the glass surface. Placing a cover slip over the slide, she approached one of the available microscopes. I'm guessing I'm about to see for myself what you found. Shouta drawled. Yes, Kuro whispered as she shifted the slide into place and covered it with the stage clips. Look, she said in fascination. Shouta walked towards where she was standing and looked inside the eyepiece. His usually stoic features morphing with shock and amazement. There, magnified a hundred times in Izuku's blood, were microscopic black symbols painting a clear picture onto each faintly glowing cell. Not only that, but between each writhing cell a black, almost wispy substance coated the spaces in between. I don't think, Kiro began slowly, I don't think that the N, A's on the chart was a glitch in the system. She paused, contemplating how to say this without causing alarm. Shouta glanced up from the microscope, awaiting whatever she was going to say next with apprehension. I, I think it's simply a compound that has never been discovered before. Shouta's eyes widened in disbelief, unable to believe what he was hearing. It's possible. In today's world, anything is. Holy crap. Shouta muttered. He is an angel. Chapter 3. The best we can do. Notes. Trigger warnings for starvation and suicidal thoughts, actions. This one is a fucking roller coaster, my guys. I've been up all night writing, all for you. Pay me in tears. Enjoy, my gremlins. D. Chapter text. Shouta had been gone for half an hour by the time he returned to Izuku's hospital room. He lightly knocked on the door, not awaiting a response before opening it and stepping inside with a strained look on his otherwise blank face. May I speak to you three in the hallway? He asked. The trio shared a look, knowing this had to be about whatever Izuku's doctor had shown him. Of course, Tsukachi said lightly as they all got to their feet and followed Shouta into the hall. The exhausted-looking man waited for the door to shut completely before he started. I believe he was telling the truth, he said quietly. And you didn't before. His Ashi asked. He gave his shout an incredulous look as he said, but Tsukachi used his quirk. He turned to Nimori, his expression curious. Does this have anything to do with what you two stepped out of the room to talk about? He asked her. However, Nimori didn't respond, as the previous revelation was the only thing to register in her mind. The woman had perked up at Shouta's declaration, her interest peaked. She ignored his Ashi, who hadn't been a part of the conversation they'd shared earlier, as she stepped closer to Shouta. She gazed at him with a somewhat quizzical expression, though it was more relieved than anything else. What changed your mind? She asked. Whatever it was had to be big, or he wouldn't sound so sure of himself. Nimiri would be lying if she said she didn't have some doubts of her own, doubts which Shouta had placed in her mind earlier with his talk of all for one and villainy. You were so against it not too long ago, so what happened? What's causing you to reconsider your theory? She paused, eyes narrowing before she added, Not that I'm complaining. I never wanted to doubt the poor kid in the first place. The way she'd said it made Shouta scowl deeply. She made it sound as if doubting the boy was a damn crime, but questioning his motives wasn't even a betrayal. You can't trust just anyone. 
not in our line of work. Of course, he'd wanted to believe Izuku, but how could he not have reservations about something so profound? It was unbelievable at best and lunacy at worst. Shaking his head to clear his thoughts, he pulled the blood he'd nicked from the lab out of his pocket, holding it up for them to see. This, he stated, Izuku's blood. The group only frowned at him, not quite understanding, tilting his head confusedly. Hizashi asked, what about it? Does it have strange properties or something? He narrowed his eyes at the vial, trying to see if there was anything clearly off about it. You could say that, Shouta muttered. I examined this blood under a microscope. Each blood cell had these, peculiar symbols on them. There was something wispy and black between each one, and the cells themselves seemed to almost writhe and glow. He explained. Everyone appeared shocked by what they were hearing. After a long moment of stunned silence, as Shouta allowed them to absorb the information, Hizashi was the one to break the ice. I'd just like to point out that I never doubted him. He grumbled as he took the vial from Shouta's hand. He examined the contents, noticing the way the surface of the liquid never stayed consistent, even as he held the glass container still. Oh, and that's not all, Shouta added, ignoring Hizashi. The small group stared at him with rapt attention, awaiting more information. The lab worker thinks Izuku's blood holds undiscovered elements. Holy shit, Naomasa muttered. Shouta looked at them darkly. So if there was any doubt, I don't think it would be wise to hold on to those feelings any longer, he said. You're literally the only one who doubted him, though, Nimiri retorted with an eye roll. There were nods of agreement around the group at Nimiri's statement. I wouldn't have believed him had I any other quirk, Naomasa muttered. But my lie detector has never been wrong before. Shouta shook his head. Listen, I'm sorry I doubted him, he told Nimiri. But you could see where I was coming from, right? His friend gave him a small smile. Of course, she flipped her hair over her shoulder, turning to Hizashi. Now, remember how you and Shu have been talking about adoption? She asked quickly, not giving Shouta the chance to cut her off as she handed out his punishment without any hesitation. Hizashi nodded his head slowly as Shouta groaned indignantly. Of course, it's been an ongoing topic of conversation between us for months now. More like an ongoing topic of argument, Shouta thought sarcastically. Well, the strangest thing happened before Izuku fell out of the sky. She gave a shark-like grin before glancing at Shouta, who only squinted his eyes shut and pinched the bridge of his nose with a long sigh. Nimuri, Shouta muttered, not wanting to be the one to have to look after some exiled angel. God only knows what kind of shit someone would have to pull to be thrown out of heaven, of all places. What are you talking about? Azashi asked curiously. He placed a hand on Shouta's shoulder gently as he stared at Nimuri expectantly. He said, the only way I'd ever adopt is if God himself asked me to. She smiled brightly at the pair. And if God practically dropping that poor angel on your front doorstep isn't him asking you two to adopt him, I don't know what is. She looked between Shouta and Hizashi expectantly, watching as Hizashi's eyes turned bright. Nimuri, I told you, Shouta began, but was promptly cut off by Hizashi's excited babbling. Of course, Hizashi beamed. Detective Tsukachi, do you think you could get some form of identification set up for Izuku? He asked happily, ignoring Shouta's loud protests. That, I can do. As for fostering or adopting him, I can get you in contact with someone from the social services side of things, he said, smirking when Shouta let out a long, exasperated sigh. As Ashi's expression was exuberant as he turned to Shouta. We're going to be fathers, Shu, he whispered excitedly. Shouta fought the urge to groan. He knew this was a battle he would inevitably lose. So instead of arguing, he let out a dismal horror. And just like that, the couple had finally settled their argument on adoption. High above, in a realm unknown to the mortals on earth, God sat on his throne. A window with wispy white tendrils emanating from its surface sat in front of him as he watched three people re-enter the hospital room they'd been talking outside. He smiled to himself, his facial expression hidden by white, ethereal veils. I answer the prayers of all my little ones, my dear angel of the void. He whispered with a hand placed against the window's surface. And you will get your wish. You will find love and happiness, my child. He gave a fond sigh and pulled his hand away. However, after a moment of content silence, his expression darkened as a much more somber feeling washed over him. The thoughts of exactly why he'd needed to fulfill that wish in the first place plagued his mind. He began contemplating the impending peril when abruptly, the sound of rapidly beating wings ripped him from his thoughts. He looked up to see the head seer rushing into the room, her wings creating a violent wind torrent as she came to a screeching halt just past the door. My lord, the seer cried as she flew, much slower now, towards the throne. With a quick motion of God's hand, the window disappeared and God angled his head to look down at the proportionally tiny creature before him. What is wrong, Azarus? He asked, concerned by the emotion she was displaying. The prophecy foretelling Earth's demise, she quivered. It has changed. God wasted no time in standing to his full, intimidating height. He loomed over the smaller angel, 
apprehension causing his form to flicker. Show me, he said quickly as he teleported the pair to the chamber of Profesha. I warn you, my lord, it is not good, she muttered quietly as she opened the scroll hanging on the wall. The scene had been frozen during what looked to be a tableau of war. God's eyes zeroed in on the figure in the center of the frame. A boy standing tall amidst the carnage, an angel with dark, curly hair, pitch black eyes possessing gold specks, and large black wings. The only angel with such defining features. Azara stared at the scene for a moment, expression stricken. She turned her attention to God, a perturbed look on her thin face. Just what were you really planning by sending Izuku down there, my lord? Azaris inquired, her tone filled with fear and suspicion. God gave the angel, who had been one of the few to oppose Izuku's exile, a gentle smile. Though he knew with his face hidden beyond an enigmatic veil, she could not see his expression. The plan, my child, he said, gesturing with a wave of his hand and causing the scene on the hanging scroll to shift. He was now able to see the beginning, where Izuku was depicted in the middle of a ruthless, bloody battle with that man, is to save Earth from him, and to have Izuku, the only one capable of such a feat, be the one to do it. Hazarus shuddered, unable to believe what God had done, the danger he'd put one of his angels in. But the truth was, she was only getting half the story. It had been three days since Izuku had crash-landed in Shouda and Hazashi's backyard. He had been waiting to be discharged from the hospital for two days by that point, but he wasn't able to be released until he had some form of identification. He also needed to be released into a parent's, or in this case, temporary guardian's care due to his age. Izuku was quiet for the most part, and no one wanted to pry into his circumstances. But even in his reticence, they'd come to learn a few things about Izuku. The fact that he was different from all the other angels, that he'd had no one in heaven, and how he'd given up on praying regularly hundreds of years ago. After that casual revelation, Shouta had asked him how old he was, to which the boy responded with a muttered, 715, sir. Both Hazashi and Shouta had been shocked to hear this, and they began to wonder if Izuku even needed guardians in the first place. Shouta was just relieved to have some form of argument on why they shouldn't adopt the kid. He brought it up with Hazashi while the pair drove home that night, but his husband had been quick to dismiss his concerns as he discussed his suspicions that Izuku may cognitively be a teenager. I mean, come on. You have to admit that it makes sense, Shu. Based on the way he looks and behaves, do you honestly think he's got a brain to match his age? And so they asked about it the next day. Izuku had pondered the question for a moment before responding in a subdued voice. I would say I'm around 14 or 15 in mortal years. Much to Hazashi's relief. It was a day later, today, that Naamasa called Hazashi to inform him that he'd gotten the paperwork filled out and that, you'd better thank me because I did some under the table, sketchy shit to get it. Hazashi only laughed and told him he'd take him out for a drink sometime soon. And that's how they ended up driving home with an angel in their back seat. Did you want to get something to eat on the way home, kiddo? Hazashi asked as he peered at Izuku from the rear view mirror. Izuku turned his gaze from the city streets to Hazashi, the gold flecks in his eyes beginning to spin quickly as his face almost lit up. Almost. Hazashi smiled at the boy, but his face fell when the golden flex slowed and Izuku's expression darkened. I can't take their hard-earned money. That would be selfish, sinful, he thought to himself, schooling his emotions and his craving for sustenance. He shook his head slowly and returned his gaze out the window. No, thanks, he muttered. I'm used to being hungry, anyway, his mind supplied. And it's not like I need to eat as much as mortals do. He leaned his head against the window, his stomach aching slightly. Hazashi frowned at what he was witnessing. Thinking back on it, had the boy eaten in the hospital? He retraced his thoughts to Izuku's stay, trying to remember whether or not he'd seen him eat. He vaguely recalled a moment when Izuku had looked at his food with disgust before placing the lid back on his meal tray, but no one had said anything about it. Why hadn't anyone said anything about it? Hazashi looked to the boy nervously as he clutched the steering wheel just a tad more tightly. Izuku, he said gently, is there a reason you don't want to eat? Izuku jolted and snapped his head to stare at his guardian, his mouth falling open and closed a few times. He shook his head slightly, noticing Shouta looking at him from the corner of his eye with his head turned ever so slightly in his direction. I, uh, Izuku spluttered. Thank, you useless Deku, thank. Actually, angels don't need to eat, he said. In a way, it was true. They only needed to eat every so often, once or twice a month, to be precise. He was confident he could get away with it. The excuse of we may not need to eat, but we do like to indulge, came to mind for when he would inevitably feel famished. And though he didn't regret the words for a while after speaking them, he'd come to soon enough. As he was lying on his bed clutching his stomach, not understanding where this god-awful pain was coming from. I've never needed to eat so soon after a meal, he groaned internally. The longest I've gone was six months, so why on the heavenly plane am I so hungry? He wanted to scream. It was like being eaten alive from the inside out. 
His mind briefly flashed to something he'd learned about while reading a book on humans, a mortal torture method where they'd cage a rat and light charcoal atop its confines, forcing the frightened rat to find an escape, the only way out being through the person's abdomen. He shuddered at the thought, but he'd been through much worse himself. If I can stand the feeling of boiling acid being poured on my wings, surely I can survive this. But the urge to eat, the craving, was unbearable. The only thing that kept him away from the kitchen was the thought that he'd be stealing from his new guardians, and it was a thought he couldn't stand to go through with. Sure, he could simply ask for an apple or a granola bar, or whatever it was they were cooking now, which smelled so tantalizingly amazing, but he couldn't steal from them. They'd already bought him clothes before he'd gotten to their house. He couldn't take more. He clutched at his stomach as it let out another painful, gurgling growl. I can't do this, he groaned aloud. I just need to find something to distract myself with, he thought as he glanced around the room. There was a television sitting on the table across from the bed, but he didn't know how to use it. He came across the same issue with the laptop sitting on the desk by a tall lamp. He was used to using scrolls to watch and read things, and even then, it was never anything near as complex as what mortals had. Just reruns of angelic sport, old and new. However, sitting beside the laptop, he spotted something that caught his eye. White paper with strange lines down the middle and what looked to be writing utensils. Izuku gasped, scurrying over to the desk and taking a seat. He picked up a black paintbrush, except, is this a paintbrush? He examined it, noticing that it had some sort of lid on top. He uncapped the utensil and looked around for some ink to dip the utensil in, sad to find none. Izuku would like to say he was able to figure it out quicker than he had, but he'd be lying. It was a very frustrating five minutes later that he finally thought to place the strange writing tool on the paper, shocked when ink flowed from the tip and onto the page. He smiled gently to himself and decided he'd practice his Japanese. It was a language he hadn't written in quite some time, and he guessed he'd probably need to use it sooner rather than later with the predicament he had landed himself in. After writing out the entire kanji, romanji, and hiragana alphabet a few times, he felt the urge to write poetry, something he hadn't done regularly in decades. As he wrote, time continued to tick by slowly. His stomach ached and protested its lack of nourishment, but he found the pain more tolerable with the distraction of writing. He wrote page after page of the same poem, tearing up the pages with undesirable stanzas and setting aside the ones he liked. It wasn't until the sun had begun to set that he stopped, his hand continuing to cramp after using it for hours on end. He stood up and peered through the window, noticing the sun slowly sinking over the horizon. One thing he hated about the mortal realm was the fact that it got dark. In heaven, there were two suns, always orbiting around one another. They were both warm and bright, and Izuku could vividly recall the sensation of their soothing rays on his skin, the heat embracing his wings. He frowned as he thought about the fact that he'd never again feel that warmth, see that light. He glanced down at the poem he'd written, a forlorn expression on his face. It was still a rough draft, but it perfectly encased how he felt at that moment. Abandoned, lonely, and without hope. He looked through the window and up to the clouds above. He knew heaven wasn't there, that only God himself could open the rift between the heavenly and mortal realms, but that didn't stop him from feeling slightly homesick. Sure, he'd never particularly liked it up there, he had no fond memories of heaven, no friends or happy stories to tell, but that was still where he'd grown up, it was still the only home he'd ever had, ever known. He may not have been happy, but heaven was familiar ground. Of earth, he knew nothing. He'd been thrown into a completely foreign realm, and he felt bitter about it. Not to mention the fact that the other angels were likely still celebrating because of his exile. Izuku's eyes began to sting as tears gathered at their corners. He quickly wiped at his face, but the tears wouldn't stop. He brought his hands up to his eyes, holding his palms against the streaming current. He bit back a sob as he closed his curtains hurriedly, effectively blocking out the reminder of his old home. My lord, God up above, Izuku choked out in his native tongue. I, I do not wish to come home. All I ask, all I ask for is forgiveness. I know I'm a sinner, I know I'm dirty, marred by sin and abhorrent, that I'm a vile, despicable Deku, but please, find it, find it in your heart to forgive me. He finished, keening into his hands. He couldn't do this, didn't want to live like this. Was he supposed to just continue living in the mortal realm for however many more millennia he had left? He choked and gasped for air at the thought. The weight of his existence only seemed to become more and more unbearable. A heavy burden pressed against his heart. The wings on his back, the hair on his head, the vanta black of his eyes. They were mere shackles chaining him to a reality he never asked for. The memories of the heavenly realm and its warmth haunted him, making every breath on earth feel like a painful reminder of what he had lost. The endless time ahead of him would be an eternity of loneliness, devoid of the celestial light he had once known. In the mortal realm he was forsaken, bound to wander aimlessly in the depths of his despair for all of eternity. Izuku was trapped. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. I'm trapped. He muttered over and over again. He watched through red-tinged vision as his tears fell and hit the wooden floor below him. 
The pain in his stomach flared, angry gurgling only serving to make him feel more wretched. You know what? He came through gasping breaths. Screw forgiveness. He summoned his abyssal blade, holding the humming instrument between his fingers as he contemplated what he could, should, do with it. This is no way to live. Not really, he thought despondently as he continued to keen. He held the blade carefully in his hands. Weapons had always been his specialty. He had ten that he could summon at any given moment, each one with its own unique ability, an extension of his deadly skill. He'd never gotten to practice in the combat plaza like everyone else. But that didn't stop him from training on his own. He held the blade to his stomach, breath coming out in short pants. Should I do this? Could he do this? He thought about the kind of life he would lead here on Earth. The way he'd outlive all of his companions. How he'd always be an outsider in a world that would never truly be his home. The thought of being forced to live in the mortal realm. Of enduring the earthly challenges he was sure to face. It was stifling. The harsh reality of mortality was that every relationship, Every connection was bound to end eventually, and Izuku would be left behind. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was destined to exist as a mere observer in a world that would never truly embrace him. Stealing his nerves, he held the blade firm against his abdomen, feeling the wispy blade cutting into his flesh with even the slightest of pressure. I have to do this, God. I bet you knew that this would happen all along. He pressed the blade deeper into his stomach, wincing as blood began to bubble up from the small wound. This was your plan, wasn't it? He asked, hands shaking and breath coming out in quick gasps. Maybe I'm a Deku. He keened through his tears. But at least I've lived true to myself to the very end. Just as he was about to slam the blade into his stomach, hands wrapped around both of his arms and pulled them away from his body. The kids in there crying again, Shouta said bluntly as he plopped down onto the living room couch. He grabbed the remote and turned on the television, perfectly content to sit there and watch a show while Izuku dealt with his emotions in the room just down the hall. As Ashi grimaced, placing the tests he was grading to the side before making his way over to his husband. He does that a lot. As Ashi remarked as he took a seat on the cushion next to Shouta. The man refused to speak on the matter as he flipped through channels aimlessly. Should we talk to him about it? Hisashi shot a wary glance at the hallway leading to Izuku's room. He'd heard the kid crying a few times now, but he'd been waiting for Izuku to come to them with what was bothering him. You can, Shouta drawled. He could see Hisashi giving him an incredulous look out of the corner of his eye, but he didn't dare meet his gaze head on. Shouta, Hisashi said gravely, unimpressed by his lack of caring. He's not solely my responsibility. You have to help him, too. At that, Shouta groaned. What do you want me to do? You know I'm no good with all that feeling crap, let alone adolescent feelings. It was a valid excuse. Hisashi had seen Shouta try to console upset students before, but he'd always had a hard time. That doesn't mean you shouldn't at least try, he addressed in a stern tone. Shouta turned to him, expression unreadable as ever. As Ashi, he began. You're the one who wanted a kid, not me. And don't even get me started on how fucked up the entire situation is. He barely talks, and when he does it's because he's crying. He doesn't eat, and by the sounds coming from his room at night, I'd say he doesn't sleep much, either. I mean, he's not even human, for fuck's sake. He's an angel, and a traumatized one to boot. They don't exactly make guidebooks on this sort of thing. As Ashi made to interject, but Shouta put a hand up to stop him. It would be different if he were human, but he's not. As Ashi stared at Shouta with concern clear on his features. Shoo, he began, but he didn't know what to say to that. Is it really so horrible for him to have a kid around? He thought back to all the arguments they'd had, Shouta's insistence that they don't adopt. Yet as Ashi had kept pushing and pushing, maybe it was wrong to force this on him. He let out a long sigh. If you really don't like him being here, I can talk to Nimari after dinner, ask her to take him in instead. But instead of agreeing right away as Hisashi thought he would, Shouta shook his head. It's not that I don't want him here. You have to understand something, Zashi. I do want kids. It's just, I'm scared I'll mess up. I'm terrified I'll make a life-altering mistake. Or that I won't be good enough. Izuku needs someone who can guide him and understand him, and I'm not sure I'm up for that. I'm afraid I'll be a failure as a parent. He admitted. Hisashi stared at him, dumbfounded by the explanation. So, all this time, Hisashi muttered. Shouta nodded his head. Yeah, that's the reason I didn't want to adopt. I just felt like I could never measure up as a parent. And now we've got a literal angel as our soon-to-be adopted son. What do you even do with that? Hazashi gave a wet chuckle, sandwiching Shouta's face between his hands. We do the best we can, he murmured as he gently pecked his husband on the lips. When Hazashi pulled away to look at him, he registered the look of uncertainty marring Shouta's expression. What's wrong? He asked. Shouta hesitated, debating what to say. I'm just wondering what the best we can would even look like in this situation. We can't read his mind, and he barely talks. How do we help him when we don't even understand what he needs? Hazashi sighed, running his fingers through Shouta's hair. We take it one step at a time. Maybe we don't have all the answers right now, but we'll figure it out, together. 
We support him, create a safe space, and maybe, just maybe, he'll start opening up to us. Shadow leaned into Hazashi's touch, the tension in his shoulders easing slightly. I just don't want to mess this up, Zashi. He's clearly been through enough shit already. Hazashi smiled softly in reassurance. We won't get it right every time, but we'll be there for him. We've got each other, and that's a good start. He gave Shouta another gentle kiss before he stood. Now, why don't we go prove that you're not a failure as a parent as you help me comfort our kid? He suggested. Shouta gave a fond eye roll and a small huff as he nodded his head. Okay, he acquiesced. Shouta followed Hazashi off the couch and the pair approached Izuku's room. They could hear a faint humming coming from behind the closed door and they glanced at one another in confusion. It was Shouta who took the lead and knocked on the door gently. Kid, you okay in there? He asked. They could hear him talking in that strange, thousand voice language, but it didn't sound like a response. He sounded like he was practically choking on the words, small keens layered thick over each vocalization. We're coming in, Hizashi announced before turning the handle and opening the door. The sight that greeted the pair made their stomachs drop. Izuku was standing in the middle of his room, blood smeared along his face and soaking through his shirt where he held a long, shadowy blade to his stomach. Izuku, Hizashi cried out, lunging for the boy and prying his hands away from his stomach. What the hell are you doing? Izuku let out a scream, the same one they'd heard in the hospital a week prior. Fighting the urge to cover his ears, Hazashi pried the weapon away from Izuku. But as soon as he managed to wrestle the blade from Izuku's hands, it vanished. Izuku, Hazashi said breathlessly now that the frightened screaming had stopped. Izuku up looked at his foster father with a panicked expression, unable to formulate words. Instead, he began to sob loudly, crashing to the floor as if his legs had simply stopped working. I'm sorry, he muttered. I, I was just feeling hopeless. I don't know what came over me, he keened into his hands. The shock somewhat wearing off, his ashy crouched down next to him and gently stroked along the small of his back. Don't apologize, kid. You have nothing to apologize for. His ashy embraced him in a reassuring hug, trying to show him that he wasn't angry, just afraid for him. Shouta, who had been standing in the doorway, made his way over to the pair. He slumped down onto the ground and sat cross-legged in front of Izuku. Are you okay? He asked and Izuku nodded shakily. Hazashi pulled away to look the boy over and registered the blood stain on Izuku's shirt with a frown. He reached out, his hand hovering just over Izuku's lower abdomen. Can I see? He asked. Izuku was silent for a moment, but eventually, he nodded once more. Hazashi pulled Izuku's shirt up slightly to assess the small cut. It was bleeding pretty heavily, but it looked to be superficial in the grand scheme of things. Okay, Hazashi muttered more to himself than anyone else. We have a first aid kit in the bathroom. I'm going to go grab it so I can clean and dress your wound. He shot to his feet and hurried from the room, leaving Shouta alone with the boy. Shouta racked his brain for something to say. But like he'd said earlier, he'd never been good at this sort of thing. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. At his ashy's words from before, Shouta steeled his nerves. He just needs to be comforted right now. I can do that. I know you said you were always alone. In heaven, he began. But you're not alone anymore, kid. Me, Hazashi. Nimuri, we're all here for you, we'll figure this out, I promise. And I know we got off on a rough start, but you're part of our family now, and we care about you. The gold flecks in Izuku's eyes spun rapidly at his words, and Shouta just hoped that meant he was doing a good job. You don't have to face everything on your own, you know. We'll support you through the tough times, and we'll also celebrate the good ones together. Just, you're not alone in this. We care, and we're here to help you heal. Izuku sat frozen for a moment and Shouta began to wonder if he hadn't shown his sincerity well enough. However, just as an apology began to form on the tip of his tongue, Izuku's wings unfurled in a quick motion and he shot forward to envelop the man in a tight hug. You don't know how much those words mean to me, Izuku mewled against his chest. Shouta could feel Izuku's bloody tears soaking into his shirt, but he couldn't find it within himself to care. Hizashi chose that moment to walk back into the room, shooting Shouta a quick thumbs up behind Izuku's back. It was apparent that he'd been listening in on the conversation, but Shouta could only give a weak smile as he rested his chin atop Izuku's fluffy black curls. Turns out the best we is better than we thought. After a long conversation with Izuku about the importance of telling someone if things got bad again, the trio made their way into the living room. So you've never watched TV? Seriously? Hizashi asked with an incredulous look on his face. At Izuku's shake of the head, he said, Man, heaven sounds boring. Izuku gave a small chuckle at that. It was, he admitted. But my experience is completely different from everyone else's, so don't quote me on that. Both Hizashi and Shouta winced at the bitterness in his tone, but neither of the pair said anything about it. Eager to change the subject, Hizashi picked up the remote and turned on the TV. So, if you had to watch a show about high school kids in the pre-hero era who use their quirks to become vigilante, or a retro show about a man who can run super fast and uses his powers to stop crime, 
Which one would you pick? Don't go putting ideas in his head, Shouta grumbled. Izuku smiled faintly at Shouta's response to the question. The one about the man who can run super fast sounds pretty cool, he said. The flash it is, as Ashi said, pumping his fist. And just like that, the night calmed, and so did Izuku. Chapter 4, Beginnings Notes, Double Update Time Things get pretty heated with Izuku's hunger in this chapter, but do not fret. The problem gets resolved. Also, Mouse Man makes an appearance in this chapter. Squints at Script Bear Man. Dog Man. Chimera Man. Moving on. I hope you enjoy reading this as much as I enjoyed writing it. Sending all my gremlins positive vibes. D. Chapter Text. He's fine. Are you fucking kidding me right now? Nimiri scoffed, glaring daggers at the pair across from her. Shouter raised an eyebrow at her vehement use of a swear word while Hazashi winced at the tone of voice she'd used to do so. He needs to see a doctor, a therapist, anyone, for what he's going through. He almost killed himself, for fuck's sake. She barked. Keep your voice down. Shouter reprimanded forcefully as he glanced to the hallway. Do not tell me to keep my voice down. I'm pissed at you too right now, she hissed. Her eyes narrowed to slits as she asked. And why didn't you think to tell me this sooner? Hazashi hesitated before responding. We were trying to handle it ourselves. We didn't want to burden you or anyone else. Nimiri's anger only intensified at his words. Handle it yourselves. She snapped. He's not just some stray cat you found in the rain. He's a traumatized kid who needs professional help. What the hell were you thinking? What do you want us to do? Get him a therapist who, A, would have to be informed of Izuku's true origins and B, would be completely out of their depth because he's literally from an entirely different world, shout a counter. Nimiri seemed to calm slightly at the logic behind what he was saying. However, they could still practically feel the rage rolling off of her like angry waves crashing against a rocky shore. Just because finding someone to help him would be difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't at least try, Nimiri shot back, her anger palpable. Shout aside, shaking his head slightly. Listen, I see where you're coming from, but it would have to be someone we trusted wholeheartedly. Even if they would be out of their depth of field, if we could find someone like that, I'd be willing to consider it. Shouta scratched at the back of his head as he spoke. As Ashi perked up suddenly and the pair turned their attention to him. What about Anui? He's a pro hero, a trusted friend. He's the perfect candidate. Nimuri raised an eyebrow, considering the suggestion. Anui, the Yui guidance counselor. She asked. I did hear that he has a knack for caring for strays. She muttered. As Ashi grinned. That's the one. He might not have dealt with angels before, then again, who has, but he's got a heart of gold. Plus, he's good with handling delicate situations. Until he gets angry, of course. Then all hope is lost. Ignoring that last bit, Shouta nodded. You're right. He's someone we can trust. If he's willing to take on the responsibility, it could be just the solution we're looking for. Nimari's exasperated expression shifted ever so slightly at the apparent solution. Well, if you think he's up for it, then talk to him. But make sure he understands the situation fully. We don't understand the situation fully. And we're his guardians, Hisashi admitted with a huff. Yeah, Nimari sighed. But you know, there would be a more feasible way to ensure he always gets the help he needs. Whenever the situation may arise she began. No, Shouta grumbled, cutting off the thought before it could gain traction. He knew where she was going with that line of thinking, and he didn't like it. Though, why not? She protested. Come on, Shouta, surely you can see the potential in him. She was not above begging for this, because I can, and I think, no, I know, that he would make an amazing pro one day. Shout aside, relenting. Sure, Nimuri, let's entertain the idea of Izuku entering Yui for a moment. He leaned back in his chair, crossing his arms over his chest. He would join with his multiple overpowered quirks, limited knowledge of current human events, and his peculiar appearance. Thinking along these lines, he'd be at an unfair advantage, he'd struggle in most of his classes, and surely suspicion would inevitably arise due to his unnatural appearance. Nimiri frowned, but she couldn't argue with his logic. Either way, she said, I think we should at least talk to him about it. The kid seems smart enough from what I've seen, I'm sure he'd catch up quickly. She shrugged, leaving the suggestion up for further discussion. I don't think it's a bad idea, Hisashi said quietly from his spot beside Shouta. Nimuri nodded in agreement, happy to have someone else on her side in this matter. See, she gloated. But, Hisashi countered and Nimuri fought the urge to roll her eyes. Shu has some good points. He sent an apologetic look in Nimuri's direction and the woman let out a long breath. No matter what we end up doing, I think it would be a good idea to get Anui involved either way. Shouta and Hisashi exchanged glances, both content with the decision to involve Hound Dog. That is a wise choice, Nimuri stated as she stood from the table and stretched out her limbs. They'd been seated at the dining table sipping coffee and chatting for a few hours by that point, talking about how their lives were going both inside and outside of work. It hadn't been until the conversation shifted focus to Izuku that the atmosphere grew tense, emotions running high as they discussed potential solutions for the troubled angel in their care. 
Of course, that was when Hisashi brought up what Izuku had done two nights before. The fact that he was alone in his room, yet again, and not on any kind of watch only served to enrage Nimuri further as she voiced her strong objections. She only calmed down when Shouta told her that they had been watching him, but stopped after Naomasa's visit earlier in the day when Izuku had admitted that it was more of a spur-of-the-moment occurrence and that he would talk to someone if he ever felt that way again. Still, their insistence that he was fine caused anger to flare up inside her chest once more, though they'd resolved everything shortly afterwards. Nimuri could feel a noticeable shift in the air, the tension in the room slowly dissipating and leaving the feeling of resolution in its wake. Did you guys want to hang out for a little longer, or are you ready to kick me to the curb? Nimuri asked as she pushed her chair in. You can stay. Shouta followed Nimuri's example and stood as well, not bothering to push in his chair as he wandered towards the couch. Why don't I go get Izuku? He's obsessed with pre-Quark-era superhero shows. We could watch the next episode of The Flash if he's up to it. Hazashi smirked slightly. It seems as though I've created a monster, he laughed. I wouldn't be surprised if he's in there watching one of your stupid shows without you, Shouta grumbled dryly. A monster, indeed. I can get him. Nimuri chirped. She didn't give either of the pair a chance to respond as she hurried down the hallway to Izuku's room. She paused midway, able to hear that same keening she'd come accustomed to from visiting Izuku in the hospital a few times. She let out a sad little sigh and turned around, deciding it would be best for Izuku's family to comfort him as much as she may want to take that role. Guys, she drew the pair's attention as she re-entered the living room with a solemn look on her face. What's wrong? Hazashi asked with concern, though he had a feeling he knew what the problem was already. Is he crying again? He asked and sighed when Nimuri nodded her head slightly. We've got this, Shouta told her as he stood from the couch, waiting for Hazashi to do the same. Hazashi gave Nimuri a small smile as he passed her on the way to Izuku's room. She returned it with one of her own, even though she looked a bit nauseous in doing so. When the pair reached the end of the hallway, it was Shouta who gently knocked on the boy's door. Izuku, he said over the sounds of high-pitched keening. Me and Zashi are coming in, okay. There was no response, but Shouta didn't hesitate in pushing open the door gently regardless. The sight that met them made their stomachs drop. Izuku, as Ashi asked in shock as soon he took in the crumpled heap on the ground. Izuku was clutching desperately at his stomach as he all but writhed around in pain. What's wrong? As Ashi cried out, alarmed by the state Izuku was in. In a few quick strides, he made it to Izuku's side, crouching down in front of the boy. Izuku, can you hear me? He asked in a panicked voice. I, Izuku let out a groan as he stopped contorting. He let out a high-pitched whine as the pain he felt overpowered his senses. I lied, Izuku admitted, cardinal tears forming in the corners of his eyes. As Ashi gave him a bemused look. About what, kiddo? He asked, anxiety evident in his tone. About the, Izuku cut himself off with another keen. His voice breaking and his arms tightening around his abdomen. About the eating thing, he admitted. Oh my god, Shouta said, shocked. Why had they simply taken Izuku's words at face value? He's skin and bones, for heaven's sake. How did we not consider that maybe there was more to the story than, actually, angels don't need to eat? Cursing to himself, he ran to the kitchen to grab a glass of water and some crackers. When he returned, Izuku was being held close to his ashy's chest as the man rubbed soothing circles into his back. Here, Shouta said gently, holding out the sleeve of crackers to Izuku with uncertainty. I'm so sorry we didn't notice sooner, kid. Why didn't you just tell us the truth? Izuku sniffled as he pulled away from his ashy's embrace. Staring at the crackers in Shouta's hands with a dismal expression on his face, he let out a soft groan at the pain in his stomach and looked away from the cracker's eye. I can't take that, he muttered, ignoring Shouta's question and wiping at his eyes with the sleeves of his, thankfully black, sweatshirt. Sure you can, Hizashi said, grabbing the crackers from Shouta's hands and pulling out a small stack. He gently took one of Izuku's hands and turned it so his palm was facing up, placing the crackers in the center. Izuku shook his head frantically. No, he cried out but continued to hold the crackers in a firm grip. With his heightened sense of smell, he was practically drooling just from holding them in proximity with his nose. I, I don't know what's wrong with me. He muttered, thinking about how just last fall he'd gone six months without eating. He let out a high keen and squeezed his eyes shut as his stomach gave a particularly painful stab. The adults looked at one another, confused by what they were witnessing. Izuku, if you have problems eating, we can work through that, Hazashi said gently. His eyes flew open at that. The flex dancing on the surface beginning to spin frantically as the angels stared at him incredulously, unable to believe what he was insinuating. What are, what are you talking about? Izuku spluttered indignantly. I'm not some teenage mortal with an eating disorder. I just can't take your food because, because it would be. Izuku trailed off, too embarrassed to continue. Because it would be what? Shouta inquired gently. Izuku averted his gaze, his shattered irises spinning more languidly now. 
because it would be sinful, he finally admitted. But neither Hazashi nor Shouta knew what the boy meant. How would that be sinful? Hazashi questioned, watching Izuku wince in pain. Because, he hissed, because you both work hard to make your money. I can't just take what amounts to the fruits of all your efforts and labor. As if on cue, Izuku's stomach let out a loud grumble and he groaned. Hizashi winced and Shouta frowned. Kid, it's not that big of a deal, Shouta stated matter-of-factly. And you need to eat. I don't know much about angel biology, but when humans don't eat, they die. Izuku shook his head frantically, shoving the crackers he was holding into Hizashi's chest. I can't, he lamented. Izuku, it's not a sin, Shouta reassured as he crouched down to meet the boy on the floor. But it's your hard-earned money. I'd be, I'd be burdening you. Izuku insisted. Hazashi shook his head, wrapping his arms around the boy and inadvertently crushing the crackers between his fingers. Izuku gasped but made no move to get away, so Hazashi held him tighter for a moment before letting him go and pulling away. Looking the boy in the eyes, he said, Listen, Izuku, we really don't mind. It's not about the money. It's about ensuring you're healthy and happy. That's not possible if you won't eat. Izuku looked down, uncertain. Shouta placed a hand on the angel's shoulder and gave it a gentle squeeze. You're our kid now, Izuku. Taking care of you is quite literally our full-time job. And part of that job is making sure you're healthy and getting something to eat when you're hungry. Hizashi nodded in agreement. And you're not a burden, kid. You're a part of this little makeshift family we've got going on. The gold of Izuku's eyes danced brilliantly as red tears streamed down his face. Okay, he muttered, clutching his stomach all the more tightly. Okay, Hizashi echoed. Okay, I'll eat something. And thank God for that. Both Hizashi and Shouta thought in unison. They watched Izuku pick up a cracker and nibble on the end uncertainly. But after that first bite, he'd all but inhaled the full sleeve, and then a second one. The room filled with a warm atmosphere as they listened to Izuku munch away on the crackers. He was so ravenous the pair wouldn't be shocked if he hadn't eaten in weeks. Little did they know, it had been months. The bell rang throughout the building, signaling the end of the school day. Shouta told his class of ten to pack up and get out, as he had business to attend to. When the classroom was finally empty of students, he made his way into the hallway and toward where he knew Ryo's office was. After walking through the bustling hallways for an indeterminate amount of time, he eventually made it to the room with the label guidance counselor on a silver plaque beside the door. He waited a few moments for Hazashi and Nimuri to show up, sure that Ryo could smell him and was getting suspicious. He tensed at the thought. When he spotted the pair speeding down the hallway and in his direction, he visibly deflated. This entire situation is nerve-wracking. You guys ready to do this? Nimuri asked as she finally made it to Shouta's side. As ready as I'll ever be. Hizashi muttered, sounding uncertain. There was a good chance Ryo wouldn't believe them. And it wasn't as if they had any substantial proof aside from Izuku himself. Nodding his head in affirmation, Shouta rapped on the door one, two, three times. Come in, a gravelly voice replied from the other side. The trio looked at one another before stealing their nerves and walking into the office. Good evening, Inui. Hizashi smiled cheerfully at the man to mask his nerves. He just hoped Ryo didn't write them all off as lunatics without so much as hearing them out. Hello, Yamada, Kayama, Aizawa. What can I help you with today? He asked. He set the papers he'd been looking at to the side so he could give them his full attention. He didn't miss the nervous expressions on all of their faces, though it was always hard to read Shouta's. If you don't know what you're looking for, that is. Has something happened? Is everyone okay? Ryo's eyes narrowed in suspicion as he scented the air for a possible threat he may have missed. No, no, nothing like that, Nimuri reassured. But there's something we need to talk to you about. Nimuri hesitated. Ryo noted her serious gaze. Yet at the same time, her body language displayed a hint of nervousness. Yes, just what is this about? He wondered. Well, Hizashi began. About a week ago now, a boy with wings crash landed in our backyard. He scratched at his head, unsure of how to continue. He was taken to the hospital and while we were there with him, we learned that he, Nimuri trailed off. Shouta let out a long breath through his nostrils. Someone has to come out and say it. The boy turned out to be an angel, and he's now living in his ashes in my care. He drawled. Ryo stared at them incredulously. Of all the things he'd been expecting to hear, that was not one of them. Pardon? He stammered. His name is Izuku. He was exiled from heaven and had no place to go, so we took him in, Shouta stated. Ryo turned in his desk chair to look at his calendar. No, it's definitely not April Fool's Day. Okay. He blinked. And you're telling me this. Why? Nimuri stepped forward, her expression filled with concern. Because he's traumatized, Inui. He has scars all over his body. He barely talks and barely leaves his room for anything. For fuck's sake. He thought that eating Shouta and his ashes food was sinful because it was like stealing from them. And of course, the other day he, he tried to. Shouta cleared his throat as he gave Nimuri a moment to compose herself. Hizashi and I walked in on him pressing a blade to his stomach. 
from what it looked like. If we were even a second later, he may not be alive right now. Shout his stomach churned at the thought. He shuddered. I almost lost my son before getting the chance to know him. Ryo's expression was unreadable as he glared over his folded hands at the trio. And I'm guessing you want me to counsel this angel? He asked in a subdued voice. That was the plan, yes. We wanted to go to someone we knew we could trust with this secret. I know you wouldn't understand his struggles, but surely you can help in some way, right? Izashi asked hopefully. I'm not sure that I fully buy this story, but yes, I would be willing to counsel the boy. Pro bono if everything you said was true, of course. The group shared looks of relief, not believing their luck, just as they thought everything had gone to plan. The door behind them creaked on its hinges as it opened slowly. The group turned toward the source of the noise, shocked to see Principal Nedzu himself standing in the doorway. That is a very interesting story. He said, please, do tell me more. After they'd begrudgingly explained everything that had happened in the past week, Nedzu hummed and thought, that is a very sad story, indeed. He hopped down from Ryo's desk and landed with a small huff on the ground. I feel for the kid, even in knowing so little about him, he muttered as if in thought. Nedzu began to pace back and forth, considering the situation. Well, it seems you've all found yourselves in quite the predicament, particularly you two. He pointed towards Hizashi and Shouter respectively. I can only assume that taking care of an angel is no small feat, especially one with such a troubled past. However, I think I may have a solution that could benefit everyone involved. Nedzu paused, looking at the trio with his sharp, intelligent eyes. I propose that if this boy, Izuku, truly is an angel, that he attend Yui. Our institution has a history of nurturing unique talents and providing a supportive environment. Given the endless possibilities of his power and the delicate nature of his situation, I believe Yui could offer him the education and support he needs while ensuring his safety. Shouta looked ready to argue, but Nedzu put a paw up to silence him. Yui is equipped to handle students with various quirks, and we prioritize the well-being of our students above all else. With our experienced staff team, specialized facilities, and a community that embraces diversity, it may just be the ideal place for Izuku to find the sense of belonging he needs to heal from his past traumas. Nedzu's proposal hung in the air, awaiting the response of the boy's guardians. Well, Hazashi trailed off, not knowing what to say. Instead, he turned to Shouta, who had his eyes locked on the ground. Shu, he murmured, it isn't a bad idea. Think of all the accommodations he'd have here, all the friends he could make. We can't keep him cooped up at the house forever. He's been alone for far too long. He trailed off, leaving Shouta to sigh heavily at his words. He contemplated the offer for a moment before straightening up and giving Nedzu a steely gaze. Fine, he acquiesced, but only if that's what he wants. Nedzu hummed an agreement and rubbed his tiny paws together. Of course, Aizawa, he will be getting in on my recommendation, as well. So no need to worry about tests of any kind. And so it became official. If Izuku agreed to it, in a month, he would join Yui. The wheels were in motion. Chapter 5, A Fresh Start Notes, shout out to Ufersants for the comment Oh god, please don't tell me that Ned's is gonna make Izuku his student skull skull skull. A child with many of centuries worth of knowledge with a sadistic rat that may or may want to overthrow the government is not a good mix, for everyone's sanity that is. From the previous chapter, it made me laugh so hard that I couldn't not write it in, even though it's not an exact quote. But it's definitely one of my favorite comments so far. I even sent it to my friend. That aside, it's the chapter you've all been waiting for. Drumroll class 1 is finally in the fic. We're officially getting into canon territory now, folks. Izuku meets Nenzu. We get a glimpse into Izuku's powers, and Shouta is genuinely fearing for Izuku's innocence. Dio and the boys of class 1 are concerned as hell. Stay tuned for the unfolding events as class 1 interacts with our angelic being. P. Enjoy, my gremlins. Lesser than 3. Chapter Text. Shouta Hizashi and Nimuri entered the house wearing matching expressions of concern. They took off their shoes by the door and stalked over to the living room, getting situated on the couches. Shouta called out for Izuku once they were all comfortable, his voice echoing through the eerily quiet house. After a moment of silence, the boy wandered out of his room hesitantly, unsettled by the deathly quiet. When he entered the living room, he reached up to his chest as he looked at the trio in question. What's wrong? He asked quietly. Nervousness filling his voice as he spoke. Why don't you come and take a seat on the couch for a moment? Izuku, Hizashi suggested as he gazed at him with apprehension. Izuku's face scrunched up as he wandered towards where they were seated, pondering what this could be about. If the burning emotions he could feel swirling around in his chest were anything to go by, it wouldn't be anything good. However, he noted that Nimuri's feelings of trepidation weren't quite as intense. He took a seat on the couch, looking at them imploringly. Is everything okay? He inquired, anxious feelings of his own beginning to wrap around his heart as he looked at each one of them, trying to grasp the severity of the situation. Thoughts began to race through Izuku's mind like a storm. 
Are they going to get rid of me? Have they finally stopped caring about me? What have I done wrong? His breath suddenly quickened as he stared at them in desperation, hoping what he thought wasn't the case. I'm, I'm sorry if I've done anything to upset you, he stammered. I don't want to be a burden, and I can leave if you want, but I would do anything to change your mind if at all possible. And I, I know I stay in my room a lot of the time, that I'm never really around. But, but please, don't get rid of me. I'll do better, I promise. I'll be quiet, and I won't eat much, and I'll stay out of your way. Just please, don't leave me alone again. His voice wavered with a mix of fear and pleading as he poured out his anxieties. His eyes filled with blood and a single tear rolled down his cheek. The group stared at him in horror, wondering where he'd gotten the impression they wanted him gone from. W.H. What? As Ashi spluttered. Of course not, Izuku. It's nothing like that, I promise. Izuku took in a shuddering breath as he reached up to wipe at his tears. Oh, thank the heavens, he said wetly. I'm sorry for jumping to conclusions. I'm just not used to anyone wanting me around. I thought I'd done something wrong, that I wasn't good enough, because I've never been good enough. He let out a barely audible keen, but the trio heard. Izu, Nimuri said as she reached out to him, hesitating. You are good enough, kid. We wouldn't stop caring about you just because you're struggling. Like Hizashi said the other day, you're part of the family now. You won't get away from us so easily. Shouta had stood up midway through his declaration and was now crouched in front of Izuku, offering him what comfort he could. He placed a tender hand on his shoulder and the boy gazed at him with a broken expression. Izuku, Hizashi added, his voice gentle. We're here for you. Always. You don't need to apologize or feel like a burden. You're important to us. Nimuri nodded in agreement. You're not alone, kid. We care about you, no matter what. Izuku, who was overwhelmed by his emotions, leaned into Shouta's touch, feeling the warmth and reassurance. His tears continued to fall, but this time, they were more of relief, only slightly tinged with sadness. I'm sorry, he muttered muttered, his voice quiet. Don't be, kiddo. As Ashi smiled gently as Izuku turned to him, the angel looked forlorn, but at the same time somewhat comforted. The way you feel about yourself is actually one of the things we wanted to talk to you about, Shouta said. Izuku nodded and looked at him inquisitively, prompting him to continue. There's a man at Yui, a trusted friend of ours who works as a counselor. We discussed your situation with him and asked him to do some sessions with you, to which he agreed. Izuku's eyes widened minutely at the information. A counselor, he questioned, intrigued. Like a therapist, Shouta nodded his head, getting up and stalking back to his seat now that Izuku had calmed down. There was still blood smeared along his cheeks, but he was no longer actively crying. Yes, Shouta said, they're basically the same thing. Izuku nodded minutely at his words, looking to the ground as uncertainty clouded his expression. I mean, if you guys think it's necessary, I'll do it, he said hesitantly. But I don't really like talking about myself much. That's okay, Hizashi reassured. You can start slow, go at your own pace. We're not asking you to divulge all your past traumas. We just want you to talk a little about how you feel, make sure you're okay. He nudged his shoulder against Izuku's. Think you can do that, champ? Izuku gave a lopsided smile and nodded his head. He wiped away a stray tear from his earlier outburst as he said, If you think that it will be good for me, then of course I will. The adults felt relieved in getting the most important hurdle out of the way, impressed with the trust in them Izuku had displayed. If you guys think it's necessary, if you think it will be good for me. Hazashi glanced at Shouta, noticing that even he had a relieved smile on his face. That's great, Hazashi said happily. But there's one other thing, Nimuri faltered with hesitation. Izuku could feel the apprehensiveness they all felt replacing their relief as Nimuri continued. When we talked to the counselor, Hound Dog, we ended up being overheard. Izuku tensed. Did someone bad over here? He inquired, concern etching his features. Not bad, per se. Nimuri hedged. It's just that some information might have reached the wrong ears. Izuku's expression shifted from concern to anxious. Who, who overheard? He whispered nervously. The principal, Nenzu, Hizashi stated, and we think he may want you as his exclusive student. He froze at the look on Izuku's face. It was one of nervous dread, but it's not that bad. You may just have extra classes or something similar. I'm not too sure, to be honest. He's never taken a student under his wing before, let alone made a recommendation for one to join the school. He trailed off. Not that bad, Shouta thought with a scoff. A child with centuries worth of knowledge and a sadistic rat that may or may not want to overthrow the government is not a good mix for anyone's sanity. He gazed at Izuku skeptically. Not that bad, yeah, right. Izuku mulled the information over in his head. He wasn't used to so much attention, though by the sour emotions he could feel from the others, he wasn't sure whether or not it was a good thing. So I have to join this school, he asked, his voice laced with uncertainty. You don't have to. Not if you don't want to, Shouta said. He looked at Izuku with understanding. Nezu may have his reasons, but the choice is ultimately yours. If you're not comfortable with it, then that's okay. Shouta's gaze held a silent reassurance. 
He wanted to make sure Izuku knew that his feelings came first. Izuku thought about it for a moment before he said, I mean, I've never had the opportunity to go to school. In heaven, I was shunned and banned from interacting with children my age. I've always wanted to get a proper education, but that could be because I wasn't allowed to in the first place. After all, we always want what we can't have. The mood of the room instantly darkened as they listened to Izuku speak. They still didn't know what Izuku had done or why he was treated so poorly in heaven, but they assumed it had nothing to do with the angel himself. He was too pure, too innocent to do anything deserving of being treated so horribly. They believed that the reasoning lay in Izuku being different, as he had initially stated after waking up in the hospital. Does that mean you want to? Izashi asked. Izuku nodded his head. I know from what little you've said about Yui that it's a hero school, and I don't exactly know how I feel about that. But, yeah, I want to go to school. I want the chance to be normal, even if it's not in heaven. Shouta nodded his head, feeling a bit bitter. Well, if that's what you want, then you start next month. Oh, Izuku, you're going to be a hero, Nimuri said as she leaned over and hugged him. Izuku flinched at the contact but gently wrapped his arms around her in return. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a hero, Nimuri smiled. And even if he doesn't know how to feel about it, he'll make a damn good pro one day. Just like Hizashi and Shouta. His father's, you ready, kiddo? Hizashi asked as they all got out of the car. Nimuri was with them as well, as she carpooled with Shouta and Hizashi to work every morning. As ready as I'll ever be, Izuku gulped nervously. Hizashi smiled and ruffled his hair, causing Izuku to scowl. Don't look so mad. Your hair is a mess, anyway. He laughed and pulled his hand away. Me and Zashi are going to be working in the teacher's lounge. You've got two hours before homeroom starts. Shouta drawled. Izuku looked up at him and smiled despite his nerves. I have my notebook. I'm just going to write poetry and practice my Japanese writing. He replied, wringing his hands together as he spoke. Hizashi smiled at him fondly. Don't look so nervous, kid. Shu is your homeroom teacher, and you've got me for English. And I'm sure you'll make plenty of friends in no time, so you probably won't even need us soon enough. He bumped Izuku lightly as they walked through the deserted school grounds, and Izuku gave Hizashi a sweet smile. You're right, I have nothing to worry about, he said. But as soon as they entered the foyer, a small mouse, or was it a bear, perhaps a dog, approached them with a calculating gaze. He looked Izuku up and down, clearly assessing the angel. I've been waiting for you to arrive. He greeted them in a cheerful tone. You are Izuku, I presume? He asked as he watched Izuku intently. Izuku could only fidget in response, his wings twitching slightly and the gold of his eyes spinning rapidly. I have nothing to worry about. I have nothing to worry about. I have nothing to worry about. Why so nervous? Nedzu asked bluntly, cutting off Izuku's repetitive mantra. Oh, I, um, he squeaked out, running a pale hand through his curly black hair. I'm not. I'm not exactly used to having all this attention on me, you know. You also have a lot of power. And you want me to be your student, so that's kind of, well, it's kind of scary to me. He muttered. Nedzu laughed heartily, making Izuku jump. There's no need to fear me, Izuku. I simply found your situation, as well as what you are, to be interesting. He placed a paw on Izuku's calf, giving him a reassuring smile. And we have much more in common than you may believe. Izuku gave a nervous laugh, doubting what he was saying. Though he could feel the genuineness of the Chimera's words in his chest, so he didn't say anything on the matter. Why don't you come down to my office, Izuku? We have much to talk about. He turned away from the boy and began walking, but Izuku stayed rooted to the spot. Somehow he felt that he didn't have a choice in the matter. Nedzu turned and eyed him expectantly. Do come along, he said. Izuku glanced at his fathers nervously. He could feel their apprehension buzzing in his chest. E, yes, sir. He muttered as he hurried after the chimera, fidgeting his fingers the whole way. Once the pair had disappeared up the stairs, Shouta let out a long sigh. I don't like this, he muttered darkly. I'm sure we have nothing to worry about. Hizashi replied as the trio began making their way to their respective classrooms. We have everything to worry about. It's Nedzu with a literal angel by his side. I wouldn't be surprised if, by the end of the year, he turns Izuku into some sort of child soldier who lives only to do his bidding. Nimuri chuckled at his words. You really are worried about him, aren't you? She questioned with a fond smile. I'd be worried about anyone whom Nedzu decided to take under his wing. He may be a genius, but he's also insane. Nimuri shook her head. He'll be fine, Shu. I genuinely hope so. So, Izuku, we've discussed how you were shunned and treated poorly during your time in heaven, how you were always alone, and how God didn't listen to your prayers. You explained that you were treated like this because you are inherently different from the other angels. You've also told me that you hold far more power than your peers in heaven and that your abilities are much greater. There was a gleam in Nedzu's eyes as he said, care to explain what those differences are, as well as what abilities you hold. Izuku tensed, looking apprehensive. His eyes began to spin languidly as he glanced to the ground in nervousness. We, well, angels are supposed to have white hair. 
white and gold eyes with no separation in the pupils and white wings. He paused, looking sad as he muttered. And as you can see, I look completely different. Menzu hummed in sympathy and nodded his head. Though he was much more interested in the latter half of his question. And your abilities? He asked. Izuku blanched. That's another part of the differences. For starters, every angel can summon celestial weapons from their feathers, though they have no special properties to them besides functioning in whatever form they take. There's a celestial blade, bow, staff, shurikens, gauntlets, a whip, crossbow, dagger, shield, and spear. None of them have real names besides what forms they take, but I've named mine based on what abilities they have. Nedzu's eyes narrowed. Go on, he prompted. Well, there's my abyssal blade, which can cut through anything. It severs the connection between atoms. Then there's my singularity bow, which can create black holes upon contact, even if caught. My ephemeral staff can control the time of living creatures in a controlled area. My cosmic shurikens can open rifts in reality and disorient my opponents as it shows them their worst, most deeply rooted fears, even if they aren't aware of them. My nebula gauntlets, which absorbs cosmic energy and releases it in controlled blasts upon contact. My void whip which is a flexible tendril of void energy that can be used to trip, disarm, or strike my opponents. It also induces a temporary feeling of weightlessness, which can disorient my enemy as well. Then there's my stellar crossbow, a weapon imbued with the power of the stars, which angels are born from, and explodes in bursts upon contact. I've never used it on another living being though, because it not only causes physical damage, but spiritual damage as well. I have my quantum dagger, which can phase through solid matter at will. My temporal shield, which temporarily slows down any non-living object coming in my direction. And lastly, there's my eclipse spear, which when slammed into the ground causes a great area of darkness that only I can see through, and that causes others to experience a disconnection from their surroundings. He paused, waiting for Nedzu's reaction. The chimera looked at him, a grin stretching across his face. Those all sound very powerful, Izuku. Is that all, or is there more? He asked, his eyes glinting. Izuku hesitated. He was reluctant to share more, but there was a sense of trust building in the conversation. After a moment of silence had passed between the pair, he decided to reveal a bit more about his abilities, cautiously selecting the information to share. I can manipulate space and time, even without my staff or shield, but doing it without my weapons gives me a headache. I can also do this thing I call void walking where I travel through a vast black space from one spot to the next in a short period. The only drawback is that I have to go to the place I want to void walk to. I'm also able to. I believe humans call it astral project. I can separate my spiritual form from my physical body. This also works on others. Then there's my ability to manipulate gravity in a short distance. I can shape reality to my will, but the results are unpredictable at best, so I don't use it too often. The last ability I have is to make my form intangible. Those are the big ones, anyway. The rest are fairly useless, like being able to silence people at will or make people tell the truth. He finished. Nenzu was looking at him with an incredulous expression, unable to believe such a small vessel could hold so much power. That is, truly incredible, Izuku. I wish to see these abilities in person sometime soon. He picked up his tea and took a contemplative sip, eyeing the boy thoughtfully. And you said that the other angels are not capable of such feats? Izuku shook his head. They can control the feathers of their wings, much like the hero. Oh, what was his name? He trailed off. Pox. Nenzu supplied helpfully. Izuku nodded. Yeah, him. I actually wouldn't be surprised if he had an angelic heritage. After all, I'm not the first angel to be exiled to Earth. Nedzu grinned, his little nose twitching. No, but you must certainly be the first of your caliber. Why heaven was so indifferent in seeing you depart is a mystery to me. You have quite a reservoir of potential, Izuku. Nedzu hopped down from his chair and made his way over to the boy. But, moving along, there is one thing that has been bothering me about what I was told of you. He gazed up at Izuku with his beady eyes, frowning. Izuku gulped. What, what is it? He asked. Nedzu pondered how to put this gently, as surely it was a sore spot for the boy. I have been informed that you have scars, which are quite extensive. His expression was soft as he watched Izuku glance away. May I ask what they are from? Izuku's expression darkened, the specks in his eyes spinning rapidly. No, you may not, he said in a quiet, icy voice. Are we done here? I wanted to write some poetry before school starts for the day. He said as he glowered at the ground. Not wanting to push or pry, Nedzu nodded gently. You may go, Izuku, if that is what you wish to do. I am in no way forcing you to be here, Nedzu stated. Izuku stood with clenched fists, which Nedzu could see were shaking, and he exited the room. Once gone, Nedzu sat down and began to write out everything Izuku had told him, both of heaven as well as his powers. However, he couldn't get his mind off of the look on Izuku's face, the way he had shaken, or the implication that whatever had happened to him, been done to him, was deeply, horribly wrong. 
There's a story there, Nenzu thought, and I will find out what it is. Izuku had been writing in his notebook for half an hour when someone entered the room. He glanced up to see a boy with blue hair and glasses looking at him with a shocked expression. Izuku could feel the mix of surprise and curiosity buzzing in his chest, but he couldn't tell if it was because of his appearance or something else. Good morning, fellow classmate. It is good to see someone who is so diligent in being prepared for class. I had assumed I'd be the earliest one. He laughed while chopping his arms almost robotically. Izuku gave him a stunned expression. Oh, no, actually, our homeroom teacher is my guardian, so I had to come in early with him, he said slowly, gauging the boy's reaction. Ah, that makes sense then, he said, walking up to where Izuku was seated. He stretched out his arm and Izuku stared at it, unsure of what the gesture meant. My name is Ida Tenya. it is nice to meet you. He smiled, still holding out his hand for Izuku to shake. Izuku hesitated on what to do and took his outstretched hand, hoping he was doing the right thing. Tenya's grin widened as he shook Izuku's hand up and down vigorously. Izuku flinched and wondered if this was a normal occurrence, and if it is. Just, why? I'm Aizawa Yamada Izuku, but you can call me by my first name. It's a pleasure. He matched Tenya's wide smile with a much weaker one, but it was a smile nonetheless. The pleasure is all mine, Tenya said as he released Izuku's hand. The angel fought the urge to cradle his hand to his chest, genuinely confused as to why Tenya had done that. So your parents are teachers here? I recognize the name Yamada as our English teacher. Tenya smiled down at Izuku, and he could feel the genuine warmth coming from the boy. Are all humans in this realm so nice? He wondered. Yeah, they took me in about a month ago now, so it's a pretty recent development. He watched as Tenya tensed, a feeling of remorse replacing the previous warm. Oh, he said. That must have been a big change. Tenya wanted to ask what had happened to Izuku's parents but refrained. It would be extremely unbecoming to ask such a personal, sensitive question, especially as we've only just met. Izuku nodded his head. Yeah, everything's been pretty hectic since I was ex, uh, placed in their care. He cursed himself for nearly coming out and saying exiled. You've been interacting with another human for all of two minutes and you almost say something incriminating. Pathetic. He cringed at the thought. I can only imagine, Tenya said solemnly. He sensed the boy's unease at the topic of conversation and searched for a way to change the subject. He studied Izuku for a moment before shifting his gaze to the notebook sitting on the desk in front of him, its pages filled with scribbled out words and methodical sentences. Your dedication to your studies is quite evident, Tenure remarked, his eyes scanning the chaotic contents of Izuku's notebook. Izuku's face heated up as he hid the page, not wanting the boy to see he was embarrassingly writing poetry. He, yeah, he spluttered. Tenya smiled at him not understanding the situation but finding Izuku's actions comedic nonetheless. If you ever need assistance in catching up on class material or if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I am here to help my classmates excel academically. He offered, sincerity evident in his tone. Izuku managed a small smile, appreciating the gesture. Thank you, Ida. I might take you up on that offer sometime. As the conversation continued, Tenya shared information about the various activities and events at Yue. He mentioned the rigorous training the practical exams, and the upcoming sports festival that the entire school eagerly anticipated every year. Izuku listened attentively, absorbing the details as Tenya continued on. Despite his initial nervousness about coming here, Tenya's friendly demeanor and willingness to help put him at ease. The way Tenya talked to him, like he was a normal person, not something to be hated or scorned, made Izuku feel a sense of belonging. It was something he hadn't felt before. After talking for a while, the door to the classroom slammed open, causing Izuku to jump and look toward the source of the noise and fear. But instead of a threat, it was just a boy. He had blonde spiky hair and wore a deep frown as he glanced at the pair, who had stopped talking to look his way. The fuck you looking at? He asked with a scowl, his tone filled with irritation. You shouldn't swear. Also, you are being extremely rude right now. Tenya exclaimed while chopping his arms wildly. Yeah, so... What's your point, four eyes? He scoffed as he stomped into the room and took a seat in front of Izuku. Oh, heavens up above. Please don't tell me that's his assigned seat. Izuku didn't think he'd be able to cope with having to sit behind this angry delinquent-looking boy all year. Izuku watched as the blonde put his feet up on the desk, and Izuku felt Tenya's emotions flare intensely. Do you have no manners? He scolded. Put your feet down. Oh, please, get off your high horse. You ain't a teacher, so don't tell me what to do, you fucking extra. He retorted with an exaggerated eye roll. Excuse me, were you raised in a barn? Tenya's arms began chopping up and down more violently, but the boy he was addressing didn't seem to care in the slightest. It seemed as though Izuku had gotten a harsh slap in the face from reality. No, all humans are not kind. He looked away from the argument nervously. He didn't have it in him to help his new classmate, 
Was it too soon to call him a friend? So instead he watched the clock, anxiously waiting for the next 30 minutes to pass. Class can't start soon enough, he thought. He just hoped that the appearance of a teacher and the distraction of lessons would be enough to shift the boy's attitude. Eventually, other students began to pour into the classroom, and Tenya had left the blonde boy alone. Izuku wouldn't be lying if he said the boy didn't scare him. Then again, so do a lot of things in the mortal realm. He thought with a sigh. Oh my god. Someone yelled, startling Izuku with both their volume and casual use of his lord's name. He looked around for the source of the noise, noticing a brunette with pink cheeks bounding up to him. Hi, she cooed. Uh, hi, Izuku replied, unsure of why she felt so excited. You look so cool, she said cheerfully, leaning over his desk to peer into his gold and vanta black eyes. He shifted his gaze away from her, unsure of what to say to that. She reached out and hovered a hand by one of his large black and gold wings, hesitating before she asked, can I touch them? Izuku was taken aback by her enthusiasm, genuinely surprised that she was so captivated by the way he looked. Sure, he said nervously, his wings twitching slightly before spreading out so she had better access to them. She ran a hand along the spine of his wings, her touch gentle and tender. He'd never had anyone touch his wings so softly before, and somehow it felt oddly comforting. Your feathers are very soft. She touched his other wing and Izuku shuddered. His wings were sensitive, okay. I love them, she exclaimed, her eyes sparkling with admiration. At the words, Izuku's eyes stung. She loves them. No one had ever said such things about his wings before. They were a mark of sin, something to be scorned and looked down upon. The simple act of appreciation caught him off guard, and he couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness in his chest. In that moment, the weight of his past, the rejection he'd faced, pressed a little heavier on his shoulders. He couldn't help it as red tears filled his eyes, their golden flecks beginning to spin. Your eyes, the girl shouted, drawing the class's attention to the pair. They're bleeding, and, and spinning. She ran to grab a tissue from the teacher's desk as the class gathered around them. Dude, are you okay? A boy with what looked to be a black lightning bolt in his otherwise blonde hair asked worriedly. You should go see the nurse, recovery girl, someone else said. The brunette quickly returned to Izuku, holding out a tissue for him to take. He grabbed it hurriedly and pressed it to his eyes, his nerves spiking as the attention of nearly his whole class was drawn to him. It, it's normal, he assured them, trying to ease their concerns. It doesn't look normal. A boy with curly purple hair, much like his own, drawled. He shook his head frantically. It is, I swear. I, I cry blood. He admitted embarrassedly. His cheeks warmed at the fact that he just admitted that. And he only wanted to cry harder when he saw the blonde delinquent from earlier glaring at him. What? A red-haired boy exclaimed as he, along with the rest of the class, stared in shock. But why are you crying in the first place? A girl with a nasally voice and long green hair tied in a bow asked. I just, I get emotional very easily. He admitted hoarsely. He reached up to his chest as the brunette who had been talking to him earlier began to feel guilty, obviously thinking his tears were her fault. Listen, I, I swear it's normal and that I'm okay, so just please, give me some space. He wanted to say but found himself faltering. He squeezed his eyes shut as his wings curled up slightly. He didn't like this. A boy with a scar on his left eye seemed to understand his discomfort and stepped in. Guys, back up. You're clearly scaring him, he directed. The class finally seemed to take in the discomfort etched across Izuku's features, looking ashamed as they did as he said. They took a few steps back so they no longer crowded around Izuku's desk. The angel opened his eyes and gave the two-tone boy an appreciative look, to which he nodded his head in return. That's hella weird, a pink girl said, her curiosity evident, but also kinda cool. It matches the look you've got going on. She pointedly glanced at his wings before she backed away and took a seat at her desk. Izuku watched as the blonde boy turned around in his seat and thanked the heavens for that. Before the class could erupt into more questions, the door to the room opened and they all glanced over to see a man, Caterpillar, in a sleeping bag scooting into the room, effectively silencing the class. What the? Someone muttered as the man wormed his way inside. He made it to the teacher's podium and unzipped his sleeping bag from the inside, standing and glaring at them all. It was only Izuku and Tenya who noticed Shouta's eyes linger on Izuku slightly longer than everyone else. Good morning, everyone. I am your homeroom teacher, Aizawa, he said in a dry voice. I will make one thing clear from the get-go. I do not tolerate nonsense, and I will not hesitate to expel anyone who steps out of line or who I deem to have no potential. The class stared at him in horror, realizing the uncompromising standards they would be expected to meet. No hero becomes great without facing adversity, and I am here to prepare you for the challenges ahead. The path to becoming a hero is not easy, and if you can't handle my training methods, you won't make it far in this profession. Those of you who are serious about training their quirks and skills will find success under my guidance. The rest will be weeded out. There were audible gulps around the room, and Izuku fought the urge to shudder. 
Now, I want you all to put on your gym uniforms and meet me in the field outside. We will be doing a quirk apprehension test so I can gauge what I'm working with this year, he stated as he began to walk toward the door. But, sir, someone called out. What about orientation? Shouta turned to look at the class and they all tensed, feeling a sharp chill work its way up their spines. This is a school for heroics. Heroes don't have time for frivolous things such as orientation. If you're serious about this, prove it on the field, he said sternly. Now, let's go. And with that, the class grabbed their uniforms and hurried after their teacher. Man, Mr. Aizawa is scary. The blonde boy with a lightning bolt mark in his hair shuddered. You're telling me. If he was serious, I'll probably be expelled by the time the test is over. A boy with strange elbows groaned loudly. Tenya began chopping his arms as Izuku took off his shirt. Do not sell yourself short. I'm sure you will excel here at Yui. You made it into the hero course, after all. Yeah, but I barely scraped by with enough villain points to pass. And don't even get me started on the practical, he lamented as he pulled his pants off. It was just as Izuku did the same that his red-headed classmate took notice of him standing in the corner trying to change discreetly, away from everyone's prying eyes and questions. Whoa, dude, those are some gnarly scars, he said, looking horrified. Are they scars? They're golden. The room's focus shifted to Izuku, who fanned out his wings to cover his body so that only his head was sticking out. He noticed the intense gaze of the spiky-haired angry boy from earlier, who was scowling at him in scrutiny. However, even with his angry gaze piercing him with its intensity, he could feel the boy's genuine concern flood his chest, along with everyone else. It's, it's nothing, he muttered as he pulled on his pants while hiding behind his wings. However, he ran into a problem when he had to maneuver his shirt on, having no choice but to unfurl his wings and thread the massive appendages through the holes in the back of his uniform. That doesn't look like nothing. A boy with a large tail poking out behind him said in concern. What happened? He continued. Izuku shook his head frantically, unwilling to answer. He hadn't even disclosed what caused his scars to his guardians. He wasn't about to go into his tragic backstory marred with torture and experimentation with a group full of strangers. He managed to get his shirt on as quickly as he could, ignoring his classmates as they continued to ask questions. Once he was done changing, he rushed from the room, leaving a stunned group behind in his wake. Dude, that's messed up, the redhead muttered, looking solemn. I wonder what happened. They looked pretty bad. The boy with weird elbows added. With that, the changing room fell into contemplative silence as the boys of Wana thought about their wing classmate. A certain boy with dual quirks could only stare after the door from which Izuku had just exited, a knot of worry tightening in his chest. Whatever it was, I hope he's okay. Good, you're all here. We can finally begin, Shouta drawled as he glared at the class assessingly. Now, as most of you are probably aware, the national averages for physical fitness tests are based on records where you're not allowed to use your quirks. I assume you all did this in junior high, correct? He asked. A chorus of yes, Mr. Aizawa s echoed from everyone, and shout aside audibly. It's not rational, and why the Ministry of Education continues to procrastinate in changing their flawed system is beyond me, he grumbled. Either way, unlike in junior high, today you will be using your quirks for this test. He scanned the class, his gaze lingering on each student. He happened to notice a few of the boys glancing at Izuku in concern, and if he had to hazard a guess, he assumed it was because they'd seen his scars in the changing room. He sighed once more, his displeasure with the situation making itself known. Bakugu Katsuki. He said and the boy stepped forward, a scowl on his face as he glanced away from Izuku into Shouta. What? He scoffed, frowning at the man. Tenya had to physically fight the urge to reprimand the boy for his rude behavior. Shouta ignored the boy's brash demeanor and continued on as if nothing had been amiss. You finished at the top of the practical exams, correct? He asked. Katsuki smirked, a look of pride replacing his scowl. Yeah, what of it? He replied, arrogance clear in his tone. In junior high, what was your best result of the softball throw? He asked. He blinked lazily at the boy in front of him as he awaited a response. 67 meters, he replied, looking to the softball in the man's hand. Do I get to fuck some shit up with my quirk? He wondered. Hell yeah. Shouta threw him the ball and he caught it with ease, turning it over in his hand. Stand in that circle over there, he directed and Katsuki did as told, going to stand within the painted lines drawn on the field. Use your quirk to throw the ball as far as possible. You can do whatever you want as long as you stay within the circle. A wicked grin split across Katsuki's face. He pulled the arm holding the ball back menacingly and readied an explosion. Die, he yelled as he launched it into the air with a blast from his hand. The ball sailed through the air, disappearing from their sight as Katsuki turned to Shouta with a smirk on his face. Meanwhile, the class looked on in stunned silence. Dai, one of the girls muttered in horror. Heroes must confront challenges and test their limits. Shouta held up the small device he'd been holding, showing an astounding 705.2. Know your maximum. That is the only way to become a hero. 
The shock wore off as the class burst out into excited chattering. 700 meters. Whoa, one of the students muttered, impressed. This looks so fun. I can't wait for my turn. The pink girl from earlier exclaimed as she held her hands together excitedly. At that, Shouta scoffed, drawing the class attention. Fun, you say? He retorted coolly. If you're not going to take this seriously, then you're clearly not cut out to be a hero. His gaze hardened as the girl shrunk in on herself, looking slightly terrified. Here's something fun for you. The person with the lowest score on all the tests combined will be expelled immediately following the exam. Is that fun enough for you? He drawled. The class gasped, unable to believe what they were hearing. But, but sir, everyone has worked so hard to get here. You can't possibly take this opportunity away from us over such a trivial comment. An invisible girl cried out indignantly. Shouta merely shook his head. As I said previously, I will not hesitate to expel anyone I deem to have no potential. He reiterated sternly. If you have a problem with my teaching methods, you can pack your things and leave by your own volition. But, there is nothing more to be said. Hagakir, Shouta stated flatly. If you're done complaining, we will begin with the 50-meter dash. And with that, the class fell into a tense silence as they prepared to start their tests. Izuku could feel a myriad of emotions coming from his peers, determination, fear, hopelessness. He glanced to the purple-haired teen worriedly, noting that his feelings were the strongest. There was only one thing he could do. Surely Shouta wouldn't expel his own foster son, especially with the principal having shown a fondness for him and being in his favor. Then again, today I've come to witness a completely different version of the man I thought I knew. Even so, his eyes showed with determination as his features set in resolve. That's right, I will fail every test. Chapter 6, Sacrifices to be Made Notes, Who oh boy, some of you might be mad at me for this one. I make Izuku cry. But it's okay, our favorite cinnamon roll gets cheered up by the entirety of Class 1A. D. Also, I have been made aware that the quirk apprehension test most likely took place during their opening ceremony. However, seeing as to the fact I've already written this as their first day in the previous chapter, we'll just pretend the opening ceremony is during their first day. With that out of the way, I hope you enjoy. Now on to the chappy, my gremlins. D. Chapter Text Hey, Izuku said, approaching the purple-haired teen as he stretched in preparation for his run. The boy stood up from his bent-legged position and glanced at Izuku apprehensively, not understanding what reason he could have for talking to him. If he knew my quirk, he wouldn't be so willing, he thought with a bitter taste on his tongue. What do you want? He asked warily. He gave Izuku a once-over, assessing him coldly. A skeptical expression crossed his face as he arched an eyebrow expectantly. He felt a bit bad for acting rudely, especially knowing the boy had baggage of his own to deal with. However, what he'd seen in the changing room, while concerning, didn't mean he was going to treat the boy any differently. Izuku gave him a small, sheepish smile and reached out his hand in the gesture he'd learned that morning. My name is Izuku. It's nice to meet you. The purple-haired boy looked tentatively at his outstretched hand, hesitating before he reluctantly shook it. My name is Shinsu, Shinsu Itoshi. He pulled his hand away and took a step back, maintaining a guarded demeanor. He didn't answer my question. The golden flecks in Izuku's eyes started spinning slowly. Hitoshi didn't know what was going on or if he was using his quirk on him, if those wings of his weren't his only quirk to begin with. But the boy eased his concerns as he leaned in close and whispered in a hushed voice, I know you're worried, but don't be. I've got it covered. How does he know I'm afraid of failing? Hitoshi wondered, his mind racing with uncertainty. The golden flecks in Izuku's eyes had stopped spinning, leaving Hitoshi both intrigued and slightly unnerved. He stared at the boy in confusion for a moment barely having time to ponder what he had said before Izuku turned and walked away from him. As Hitoshi watched Izuku join the group of students, an air of mystery hung around him, leaving Hitoshi to wonder about the extent of his quirk. I guess I'll see for myself when it's his turn to participate. With that thought, he went back to stretching, though he couldn't get the thought of Izuku and his black and gold, spinning eyes out of his head. When Shouta called for them to start, he focused his energy on his legs and feet, putting all his effort into spiriting towards the finish line. When he reached the goal and the robot called out his time, 9.7 seconds, he cursed himself for his apparent worthlessness. The other students who had shared his turn, a brunette girl and a red-headed boy, had easily run ahead of him. They'd done better than him and they hadn't even used their quirks. Well, he didn't think they had, anyway. He'd had the thought, the fleeting hope, that Izuku had used his quirk on him so he could perform better in the tests, but apparently, he'd been wrong. Fuck, Hitoshi spat in his mind. I'm going to be expelled and without even having shown an ounce of potential. His mind flashed to the scathing words of his peers. The ridicule meant to demean his dream of becoming a hero. They're applying to the Yui hero course. You, one voice laughed. Yui doesn't accept villains, another mocked. Good luck getting in with a quirk like that. His eyes turned downcast as he became lost in thought. They were right, they were all right. Why the hell did I ever think I could become a hero? 
I'm useless. He turned around and coldly watched as Izuku took the spot he'd previously been in. Asshole, he thought. He probably did that on purpose, to give me false hope. He saw how nervous I was and thought, wouldn't it be fun to mess with this worthless loser? Itoshi grit his teeth at the notion. There were still nine other tests. He could do it, he refused to fail. Just as his train of thought began to spiral, he was pulled out of his head by Shouta calling for the lineup of students to start their sprint. Izuku could feel the entire class's emotions shift while they watched on in confusion and bafflement, while both the frog girl and the boy with engines in his calves gave it their all in speeding towards the finish line. Izuku walked at a languid pace toward the end, glaring at their teacher the entire time. Shouta's features morphed into a shocked expression, instantly realizing what Izuku's plan was. This brat. He knows I won't kick him out, so he's going to take last place. He thought, slightly irritated, though he couldn't help the feeling of a fond smile wanting to stretch his lips. Of course he'd do that. He shook his head in amusement, careful to keep his expression neutral. Izuku, do you want to try that again? Shouta drawled with fake exasperation once the robot called out his time. Izuku gave him an icy scowl and shook his head. No, Mr. Aizawa, I think I did just fine as is. The class watched the exchange in tense silence, not understanding what was going on. Shout aside, all right, fine, he muttered. He was about to call up the next set of students when the PAW system crackled to life. Nadzu's voice could be heard calling for the teachers to make their way to the gym, where orientation was taking place, stating there was an emergency quirk use situation. Letting out a huff, Shout turned to his class. Stay here and behave yourselves. For go, he cut himself off with a glance at his son. Heaven's sake, I will be back as soon as possible. He told them as he hurried away from the class, rushing back to the building to deal with whatever the hell had happened now. Meanwhile, Hitoshi was lost in thought. He was unable to understand why Izuku had merely walked to the finish line as if he couldn't care less about getting a good score. With those wings, he could have easily taken second place. So why? Suddenly, his words from earlier played in his mind. I've got it covered, he had said confidently. Is he seriously going to get himself expelled to protect everyone else? Fury abruptly surged within Hitoshi as anger overtook him, unable to believe what Izuku was thinking. Izuku turned to him quickly, a shocked look on his face as he reached a hand up to his chest. Hitoshi marched up to the angel, who stood there with a mix of confusion and fear. You call that having things covered? Hitoshi snapped, his voice cutting through the tense silence. His towering figure loomed over Izuku, who was much smaller in comparison. The class watched on in bewilderment, unsure of what the unfolding confrontation was about. Hitoshi's frustration spilled out as he berated Izuku for what he perceived to be a foolish decision. You have those wings. You could have easily passed the test with flying colors. Why throw away your chance at Yui for someone else? He exclaimed, his voice filled with incredulity. Izuku's shocked expression gradually transformed into a mix of apprehension and unease. It, it's not about me, he said quietly, voice trembling. I have my reasons, Shinsu, and you're and you're not grasping the full situation here. Ignoring the latter half of what Izuku had said, Hitoshi shook his head, unable to comprehend what reasons he could possibly have for throwing away the opportunity to become a hero. You're being naive. This is your chance, and you're wasting it on some misguided idea of heroism. You should try for yourself, not sacrifice everything for others. The tension in the air escalated as the two stared at one another, one with boiling anger and the other in nervous dread. The class remained silent, absorbing the intensity of the moment and unsure of how this confrontation would unfold. Izuku, though clearly frightened, held his ground, meeting Hitoshi's gaze head-on. Being a hero means more than just winning a race or proving oneself. It's about making sacrifices for the greater good, even if others can't see it. And I'm not even making it. Hitoshi cut him off before he could finish. Sacrifices? This isn't a sacrifice, it's stupidity. You're letting an amazing opportunity slip away for some vague ideal. It's not heroic, it's foolish. He scoffed, his anger unabated. Izuku's eyes spun rapidly as he backed away from the boy, cowering slightly. You don't understand, he muttered. Of course I understand. You're being idiotic. Hitoshi shouted, fuming. Shinsu, Izuku started. You really don't. Hitoshi glared at the raven-haired teen, not backing down as he cut him off once more. How can you throw away an opportunity like this? Do you know how hard it was for someone like me to even get a chance? You're acting as if this is some grand heroic sacrifice. But all I see is you being reckless with your own future. Do you even realize how infuriating it is to watch you squander what others would kill for? You're not a hero, Izuku. You're just a fool with a misplaced sense of altruism. And it's infuriating to see someone so oblivious to their own stupidity. You're not some fucking martyr, you're a waste of talent. What you're doing should be considered a goddamn sin. Throwing everything away like that. Hitoshi's words were sharp, fueled by frustration and anger. Suddenly, blood-red tears filled Izuku's eyes as he looked away. The words were hurtful, sure, but it was the part about sin that had truly cut deep. 
Of course, there was no way for Hitoshi to know the pain those words held in Izuku's eyes, so he couldn't fault the boy. He tried not to take it personally, but he couldn't help it as he froze up, the words of his angelic brethren clouding his mind. Hitoshi's resolve faltered at the sight of his tears, but he didn't back down. He was throwing an amazing opportunity away. How could he not be mad? You got anything to say to that? Huh? He asked. Izuku only shook his head and reached up to his face, beginning to keen softly. The class stared at him in muted horror, both because he was crying and how he did so. No, you really don't understand, he said through his high-pitched, keening sobs. I'm not going to be expelled, even if I do poorly on the test. Izuku let out a broken sound as he wiped at his tears furiously. I'm a recommendation student, and the principal was the one who recommended me. Not to. Not to mention the fact that Mr. Aizawa is my guardian. His sobs built up and the class winced at the high-pitched cries. Hitoshi reeled back as if hit, realizing what he'd done. Izuku, I, I didn't realize, I'm sorry. He gripped the boy by the shoulder, but Izuku pulled away. And I, I already know I'm sinful, unholy, unnatural. An abhorrent freak. You don't have to remind me. He cried through keening sobs. Everyone's feelings went from stunned to confused. He could feel it buzzing chaotically in his chest. I don't expect any of you to understand. He keened in retaliation to their feelings, his voice breaking under the weight of his emotions. Shaking his head, he quietly murmured, No one in this realm understands. And he had muttered the words so low that only Shinsu had heard him. The boy was bewildered by the comment, about to ask what he meant, but before he could even so much as open his mouth to speak, Izuku was unfurling his absolutely massive black wings. The gold-tipped feathers shone brilliantly in the sunlight as he prepared to take off. He began flapping them, the force behind their motion causing a torrent of wind to kick up the dust of the field. Izuku was desperate to get away, but Hitoshi stopped him before he could get off the ground by grabbing his wrist. Izuku would have easily been able to take flight, but it would be at the risk of injuring the purple-haired teen. Izuku, I'm sorry, okay. Please, just calm down. Izuku let out a few breathy gasps, but his wings curled behind him as he fell to the ground uselessly. Itoshi fell with him, making sure to hold on to him on the way down. The students who weren't already near the pair nervously made their way towards them. Are you okay, dude? The electric blonde asked. We, uh, haven't really been properly introduced. I'm Kaminari Denki. He sat down on the ground beside the boy, immediately able to tell he must have some sort of deeply rooted trauma. All the boys who had seen Izuku in the locker room could. I'm Kirishima Ijiru. The redhead said you just need to take some deep breaths and relax. He told him nervously. I'm Todoroki Shouto. The dual-haired boy murmured flatly, though Izuku could feel the concern radiating off of him. After that, they all went around introducing themselves, some giving comforting words while others simply said their names. Eventually, everyone in the class had said something, all but one particular spiky-haired blonde. The class stared at him expectantly. To CH. He glared at the boy with furrowed brows. The name's Bakugu Katsuki, but you already knew that, he grumbled, referring to earlier when their teacher had specifically called on him for the softball throw. Don't cry, you shithead. It's unbecoming of a hero. He glanced away, Izuku feeling the nervousness radiating off of him. He sniffled a few times near silently as Tenya began to rant about this being no time for insults. Can't you see he's upset? Achako glowered after Tenya had finished his rant. What the fuck ever, glasses, round cheeks, he scoffed. Izuku glanced up at them, nervousness written across his face. I'm sorry, he managed to get out through choppy breaths. Like I said earlier, I get worked up easily. The class frowned at him, a tense silence hanging in the air. It was Shouto who broke the somber atmosphere as he said, It's okay, Izuku. We all go through hard times. Getting over life's hurdles and learning along the way is what truly matters. Please, don't apologize for something that wasn't your fault. Hitoshi flinched at his words, knowing exactly whose fault it was. I really am sorry, Izuku. You have every right to be mad at me. You, you were right earlier. I didn't understand the situation. And even though you tried explaining it to me, I just continued to rant in your face. He paused, looking solemn. I'm so, so sorry, he muttered remorsefully. Izuku shook his head, looking at him as his eyes spun languidly. It's okay. It's not your fault I can't handle the truth. I'm just a bit of a baby, he chuckled wetly, eyes beginning to fill with red tears again. Lighten the fuck up, Katsuki scoffed. Stop pitying yourself and do something about it to change. You're only a pussy if you think you're a pussy. Izuku stared up at him with wide eyes. His words were harsh, but the feelings swirling in Izuku's chest told him that this was his way of offering comfort. Bakugu. Ida barked as he chopped his arms frantically. How dare you? But before he could continue, Izuku cut him off. It's okay, Ida. He's right. I am what I believe myself to be. And if I can't learn to grow past that, I'll never change. He mumbled. Thank you, Kaken. Katsuki spluttered at the nickname. What you call me, shit nerd. Kaken, he repeated. 
Katsuki looked pissed beyond belief as explosions popped in the palms of his hands. Don't call me that cutesy fucking nickname, I'll kill you. He shouted in exasperation. Izuku only smiled as he looked around at his classmates. Maybe the mortal realm isn't all that bad. He remarked in his head with a small smile on his face. Threaten me all you want, Kaken. I know your words are empty. And with that, the class fell into laughter as the blonde boy began fuming in frustration. The class continued on with their quirk apprehension test when Shouta got back. Though they'd had to cut two exercises from the regime as they were short on time. When they were finally done, the class gathered around the screen showing their test results. And Hitoshi let out a relieved sigh as he noticed he was number 19, ranking just above Izuku. I'm disappointed in you, Izuku, Shouta said as the class turned around to face him. You're lucky you're the principal's recommendation student. Or I would have expelled you for not only disrespecting my teaching but also undermining the integrity of the quirk apprehension test. Izuku gave a pointed look his father's way. They know, he told him fondly. Holding back a smile to not anger Shouta further. And my point still stands, he insisted. But Izuku could tell he was lying from the feeling of amusement he sensed coming from him. Shouta shook his head and looked away from his son. You may all get changed and head to your next class. This concludes your opening ceremony. He then turned and stalked back in the direction of the school, leaving the students to disperse with a sense of tension hanging in the air. As the girls walked toward the changing rooms, Achako spoke up wistfully. I'm kind of disappointed that boy, Izuku, didn't use his quirk. I was super excited to see what he could do, she remarked. How do you know his wings aren't his only quirk? Kayoka asked, raising an eyebrow in curiosity. Yeah, he could be like me. Nina exclaimed excitedly, forming a small pool of acid in the palm of her hands. It overflowed slightly and some dripped to the ground goopily. Momo cringed and shook her head. I would assume that he's got another aspect to his quirk. After all, he is the principal's only ever recommendation student. Wait, only? Suyu croaked, her throat sounding raspier than usual, as if she found the information surprising. They reached the locker rooms, the group slightly ahead of the cluster of boys behind them. They began taking off their clothes hurriedly, looking forward to getting to their next class. As a recommendation student myself, I found it intriguing that the principal was recommending his own student, and so late after the original period to recommend students had passed. I did some digging when I found this out a few weeks ago and found out he was the only ever student for Nedzu to take as a charge. Momo hesitated as if debating whether or not she should share the next piece of information. She shook her head, deciding it couldn't hurt. Even stranger still, I did some digging on Izuku himself, but I couldn't find anything on him. No social media, no school or sports records, nothing. It's strange, to say the least. The changing room fell into a strained silence, each of them thinking about what that could mean. But the point still stands, Mina eventually broke the tense atmosphere. Nedzu recommended him, so he has to be powerful. There were a few echoes of agreement around the room. Personally, I think he's kinda cute, Toru muttered as she pulled on her uniform skirt. Yeah, he is, but I prefer hot guys. Like Todoroki, Mina swooned dreamily, looking lost in the thought of him. But Izuku is on a whole other level of adorableness. Achako countered, looking unashamed in her preference. I agree, he is pretty adorable. Though he's a bit too thin for my liking. Suyu tilted her head as she thought about who'd stuck out to her the most in the group. I think Bakugu's pretty hot, she said with a finger on her chin. But that attitude of his is something else, Kiro. If he could keep his mouth shut I think I'd like him though. I still like Izuku. Toru huffed before turning to where Kayoka and Momo were changing. What about you, Jiru, Yeyarazu? Who do you two fancy? Blushing sheepishly, Kayoka turned her head. Actually, I like girls. She admitted a little bashfully. And I don't really like any of the boys. Not yet, at least. Momo chuckled hoarsely, forcing her gaze to stay locked onto where she thought Toru's eyes might be and not at Kayoka, the one who had actually stuck out to her. Oh, what a letdown, Toru pouted. Not that any of them could see it. By that point, both she and Kayoka had finished changing, so they began to make their way through the door. Is there a girl you fancy, at least? She asked her, wrapping an arm around her shoulders as the two walked. Kayoka's face went red as Momo's long, silky black hair pulled back into a high ponytail and intelligent ebony eyes flashed in her mind's eye. And no, no one, she laughed it off. Toru pretended to buy it, shaking her head. I'm sure you'll find someone by the end of the school year, she told her. Kayoka shook her head sadly. As if, she thought, hey, I'm serious, you're pretty cute, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lineup of girls and boys who wanted to get with you. Kayoka smiled a bit sadly, appreciating her words, as empty as they were. Yeah, she chuckled, but there was only one girl she'd set her sights on. I barely know her. God, I have to stop doing this. Little did she know, as the very girl she was thinking about walked behind her, she was thinking the same thing. Izu, Nimuri hollered when she spotted the boy with her two best friends in the parking lot. The school day had just finished for the teachers and they were making their way to the cars to head home. 
Izuku turned to Nimuri, his face lighting up at the sight of her. Hello, Kayama. He smiled bashfully as she approached. He would never get used to seeing her in her hero costume. It was way too revealing for his liking. He knew that she had to wear it for her quirk's convenience. But it was still awkward to have to look at her in such a scandalous outfit every day. How many times have I told you, Izu? It's Nimiri. She scolded lightly as she ruffled his hair with gentle fingers. Izuku gave a sheepish huff and pretended to pout. You know it's awkward for me. He responded as she pulled her hand away. She bent over so she was at eye level with him and put her hands on her hips while they walked. It's N-E-M-U-R-I, she said, spelling her name out with emphasis. Izuku's face turned red due to the proximity in which she was leaning. He wasn't used to being so close to anyone because of his time spent in heaven, let alone chesty women. But he managed to squeak out a small, why yes, Nimiri. Nimiri gave a fond laugh and rolled her eyes, watching Izuku glance at his guardians pleadingly. Leave the kid alone. Nem, Shouta intervened, his tone dry and unamused. Oh, stop being such a spoil sport. He knows I'm just teasing. They reached Shouta's car and the man unlocked it with the push of a button. They each got in the car and took their seats, Izuku and Nimuri in the back and Shouta and Hazashi up front, so I can call you Kayama. Izuku asked as Shouta backed out of the parking lot and began the short drive home. Oh, no, I was serious about that. She grinned and poked his slightly sunken cheek. He batted her hand away in annoyance, unamused by her teasing. Izuku noticed Shouta looking at them in the rearview mirror and frowned. Of course he's not going to help me, he groaned internally. The rest of the drive went by similarly, Nimuri relentlessly poking and prodding at Izuku both literally and figuratively while Shouta and Hazashi talked quietly in the front seat and ignored his suffering. When they dropped her off at her house, the car was silent. Izuku began thinking about Earth and his exile, as he sometimes did, but lately he couldn't help feeling as though he was better off here than he ever was in heaven. In the month he'd gotten to know the trio, he'd come to somewhat understand them. Shouta had come off as harsh at first, not trusting him in the slightest. He hadn't been able to listen with his enhanced hearing to all of what he and Nimiri had talked about in the hallway on his first day in the hospital, as there was a relentless buzzing in his ears from his fall. But he'd been able to catch a few words here and there, words like villain, cult, and manipulate were thrown around without hesitance. He didn't know what had caused the man to think of him as a villain, but he was eternally grateful to Nimiri for trusting him wholeheartedly from day one. Since then, he'd come to see the man as more of a caring mentor even if he was a bit of a hard ass. But Izuku constantly felt a mix of unease and worry emanating from him, as if he were afraid of messing up. Izuku had been wanting to reassure him, as Shouta had done many times for Izuku, but found himself unable to form words of comfort. It wasn't that Izuku was hesitant to talk to him. It was more so the fact that he'd been isolated for so long that even stringing together basic sentences was a struggle sometimes, let alone comforting someone. Regardless, Izuku thought of Shouta as mysterious, intriguing, and above all, dedicated to his well-being. Hisashi was loud, caring, and kind. He was someone else who had trusted him from the beginning with not a doubt in his mind. Him and Naomasa. He was always there when Izuku needed him, constantly offering him food, even when Izuku was too afraid to ask. It was like he somehow knew. Izuku had been hungrier than he'd ever been in heaven. He assumed it had something to do with the mortal realm's influence on his body. Since he'd admitted to lying about not needing food, Hazashi had been the one to make sure he ate at least one decent meal a day. It had been hard at first, as his stomach was small and shrunken from not eating enough in hundreds of years. But Hazashi had helped him by making easy-to-eat meals, like super toast. It wasn't easy some days, as Izuku was used to eating only when the feeling got unbearable, and he didn't want to take from his caregivers. He'd also come to realize that eating normal mortal amounts, in general, was difficult, as he often felt too full after just a few bites. But his ashi persisted when he had his rough days, always there to silently encourage him when he needed it. His ashi would allow him to get away with only eating a meal or two a day, but he always made sure he had at least one. He was compassionate, warm, and supportive, always there to welcome Izuku with open arms if he had a nightmare or was feeling upset. Hazashi and Shouta shared similarities, but Nimuri, on the other hand, was a completely different dynamic. She was more like a loving older sister than a caregiver or even an adult in his life. She always pestered him about how he was doing, usually in a teasing way. She loved to annoy him with playful banter, only ruffling his hair or giving him a gentle poke when he'd inevitably get fed up with her antics. She was affectionate, nurturing and caring. He may get annoyed with her sometimes, but he never stayed mad for long, she was just too endearing to be upset with. As they pulled into the driveway of Shouta and his Ashi's house, he couldn't help the small smile that had spread across his face. How could he have ever been upset to be exiled? This was the best thing to ever happen to him. They're my family, and I'll love them for as long as I live. And he was sure they'd do the same. 